Loud. <laughs> there you go. Greetings. Greetings. Well, <clears throat> welcome to everybody to the May 11th, 2021 session of Tangerine STR and Hamside Technical Session. My name is Dave, KV0S, and this week, um, or I've been doing a few little projects and dealing with some oh, family issues and also dealing with um, getting ready to teach. <laughs> I have a class next week, which is, I've taught it several times, but it's uh, eight hours a day for five days and a lot of field work. So it's kind of fun, but it takes up a big chunk of time. Anyway, uh, uh, and I will be here for next Monday night, so uh, it should should all work fine. So next on the list, we have Nathaniel W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, things are going fine here. We're in the last week of classes for this semester at the University of Scranton. Um, I have been working with the different students. Um, and Dev, we're trying to get some presentations put together to give it the super darn workshop. Um, and I've also started uh, the process of, uh, I'd like to put one of these magnetometers at my house this summer. So I started working with our person at the university, Majid, who's gonna help me build that. And I've reached out to Dave Witten and to, um, let's see, and to Jules and a couple other people. And they said they would help us with the instructions. So I'm hoping um, we can get together an actual like manual document for how to do this and we can get it installed. And, and hopefully I'll be able to be on the magnetometer bandwagon as well. So W2NF back to net. Very good. And next on the list, we have uh, Bill, AB4EJ. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, thanks, Dave. Good evening to you. Good evening to the net. Uh, is my sound okay? Yes, just fine. Okay, very good. Well, uh, uh, my, my, my students finished their finals week before last, and so now they're able to work. I found we were able to get them to work, a couple of the grad, undergraduates to work throughout the summer, so we can make some progress on the central system. And uh, we we're about ready to try test the uh, heartbeat. Um, I can get the local host to do a heartbeat to the central system and get back the uh, appropriate response. And um, uh, my student told me, okay, if you go into the admin and uh, admin UID and request uh, it, you can request a given block of data, which uh, I just have to set up the software to recognize the bookends of the, the, the start and end times and upload it. Uh, he neglected to give me the password for the admin account though. So anyway, we'll get a, <laughs> a Zoom call uh, scheduled with, with him and the rest of the team tomorrow and, and, and uh, make some progress on that. Uh, other progress has been very, very slow. Um, uh, there is a something oddball going on with the grape. Um, I don't, Nathaniel, I don't know if we were planning on trying to run the grape uh, doing spectrum collection and in Antarctica for the upcoming Antarctic um, winter or whatever, but uh, there's something that causes that software to crash. It will run for a few days and then it gets an error. And I don't know if this is due to a memory leak or something. I'm trying to nail it down to figure out whether the problem is in GNU radio or digital RF. So I, I haven't yet nail that down, but that is a, a little bit of an issue. Um, uh, so other, other things have been going rather slowly because I upgraded my flex radio to the latest, uh, the latest software and uh, it, it broke a few things. And uh, it, <laughs> you know, when you have a system like that, you like everything to work on it. So it, it provides um, the ability to connect to it remotely with uh, something like an iPhone. And it took me four hours this morning of hacking around, uh, getting to where that remote app would work again. But 
finally we got it and we're gonna have to reprogram everything because in order to do it you had to do a factory reset da, 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 da. so you know how that goes anyway um that's that's where this thing stands from here in northport alabama back to net well fine business and next on the list i have bill in eight et go ahead bill yeah i've been uh, busy here with uh, the grape i got the uh, raspberry pi i got the image downloaded and loaded on the uh, pi and it uh, came up and displayed fl digi so i think it works um i also got all the parts in for the grape and i've been looking at it because it's all surface mount and pretty small as you all know so to get in shape for soldering i've started building another uh, kit 40 meter cw kit that uh, i'll use on field day and uh, learning how to solder again one hand and left handed and uh, went along really well until i put one part in the wrong place and I had to pull the part out and then i couldn't get the the solder out of the holes with the solder sucker or uh, the, the sucking gun so finally i had just tax soldered the part on that needed to be there so i'm making progress on that it'll be another day or two and then i'll start looking at the uh, the grape again and trying to decide that i figured i probably could do most of it and then i noticed there's a little tiny dial down in the bottom left corner of the board that is just about small enough that i can't hardly see it and i'm sort of wondering if i can get my hand steady enough to hold the, the part there and solder that in place but uh, got three boards and three sets of parts so i think one of those will at least make it through so uh, maybe by next week i'll have something to report on that but oh the other thing uh, i got on the uh, grade meeting on uh, thursday at uh, what is it 10 o'clock three o'clock whatever and uh, the meeting wasn't there and I found, you know, I went to this this site because you or this uh, meeting because you can get on there anytime. And there were two other fellows that were getting on, couldn't find the meeting either, and none of us knew what was going on. So <laughs> that was kind of a lost cause. But uh, we'll try it again this week. So that's about it. Back to you. Well, fine business. And next on the list, we have Brian AD2BA. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, I'm out in the middle of bandwidth, so I hope you can all hear me. Um, I am new to HamSci. Um, I learned about it the other week from some correspondence through my late my latest QEX article. Um, I'm a professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and I just thought this was interesting, so I thought I would check in and say hello. So that's all for me. Back to Ned. Well, Brian, welcome, and please come back if you find it interesting. I uh, hope you do. So next on the list, we have um, Dan in for XWE. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dave, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, not much to report. Uh, I mentioned last week that I'm working on uh, a loop, magnetic loop antenna, and I just got the last of the parts this afternoon. And since I have a day off tomorrow, I will try to get things put together. So kind of looking at that as maybe being a, a good answer for uh, what we're doing here. Uh, a nice little receiving loop would work and even a simple uh, transmitting loop, I think, would work. And because the power levels will probably be very low for transmitting, um, we could probably do it with a fairly simple uh, mag loop antenna without you know, four hundred dollar uh, vacuum variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, that's um, the news from here. Back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Dave KD Zero EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello. Um, again, uh, not a whole lot. Um, I've been working on some um, 3D printed mountings for magnetometers, but these are designed for boards I've, I've built, not the ones that um, um, Scotty uh, made. And I think that what Jules is documenting is doubtless quite different 
different. Um, I'm also I've been doing something else. Can't remember what it was. Um, anyway, uh, just plodding along and mostly minding my own business if I, as best I can. Thanks, and back over to you. Fine business. And next on the list, we have David, uh, N1HAC. Go ahead, David. Mike? There we go. I was switching screens. Um, yeah, I've been uh, busy trying to put together VLF ground station. Um, Murphy is having a heyday, let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, I just uh, hope O'Neill doesn't show. I think it's O'Neill that said that uh, Murphy was an optimist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm working on that. Um, we've got our um, rocket project coming up end of the month. Current uh, first chance to launch is May 26th. I noticed that uh, our predecessor or the one coming before us has been making the news because it's a um, chemical release uh, flight from Wallops and some of us on the East Coast may be able to see it. But uh, I don't know that it has even flown yet. It was supposed to fly a couple days ago, but weather and other things are getting in the way as they do with our rockets. Um, and um, one other thing I'm gonna bring up, which is um, why I'm fascinated by um, the higher frequency propagation. Um, I was on the air um, two nights ago, uh, between 10 o'clock and midnight local time. Just happened to take a look on uh, 10 meters FT8, ended up making about 20 contacts from everywhere uh, let's see, I got Texas, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Kentucky, California, 10 meters around midnight, go figure. And then uh, as I was about to go to bed, I just said, well, let's take a look at six meters. I made a contact in Illinois and two in Wisconsin. So this is an interesting field to be in, let me put it that way. <laughs> Back to net. Fine business. Yes, I noticed uh, I run a whisper beacon and both transmitter and receiving uh, multiband. And uh, things picked up a little bit in the last week. Oh, and so I forgot to mention, um, wasn't able to make contact, but I saw Edmonton, um, I think, or was it Winnipeg? Anyway, it was way out there in Canada and also saw California on yeah. six meters at midnight. Yes. So you never know. Never know. So next on the list is human, Kim, KD2MRC. Go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, well, I haven't really done much this week. Um, I'm I'll be working on the documentation so that we can, uh, uh, once the magnetometers are distributed, then uh, people can look at that uh, documentation to follow the procedures for easy installation and stuff. But otherwise, yep, that's all I can say for now. Back to that. Fine business. Uh, sorry, Dev, I jumped over you. Uh, go ahead. It's for me? Yes. Okay, because there are quite a few dips here. <laughs> so we're doing well. <laughs> and I am literally stuck in a rabbit hole uh, while debugging um, a code that I have written. It works for one set of data, but doesn't work for another set of data. So I was planning that I would try to debug it today, which I could not. So. So I am sunk in the rabbit hole for today and tomorrow. Thank you. Very good. Well, keep at it. <laughs> uh, next on the list is James, KG4DSG. Can't get the buttons working. 
Evening all, evening the net. Uh, I'm just sitting here watching this spin. I'm trying to move off of a 10 year old AMD system to the replacement tower. And it's multiple terabytes and even disk to disk, it's taking hours. So uh, I'll just sit back, watch the disks and listen in. Back to net. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Jay. WB8SBI. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, nothing really new here to report the past couple of weeks. Uh, I've had some health problems here. Had to have some surgery last week and recovering. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm now trying to get back into things. Uh, in terms of radio, uh, I still have to put together my test bench here. So I can get the parts from my Zoom DigiKey, get all my uh, soldering tools purchased, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and get my tent, my bench up and running so I can actually build this thing, uh, the, the grape, which I'm very much looking forward to doing. Uh, on an unrelated, on, on a cybersecurity related note, those of you that are into automotive cybersecurity or cybersecurity in general, the premier uh, conference for embedded systems in cars ESCAR, SCAR, takes place this week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So uh, just Google SCAR. And if, uh, if you're into embedded security, that is the conf one of the conferences you really want to attend. Uh, Nathaniel, as I was uh, doing surfing around this past weekend on FT8, I heard Whiskey Alpha 2, November Alpha Foxtrot. I wasn't able to get them because propagation winked out on me, but it was like, uh, I definitely did a double take on that to have to stop and think for a moment. Wait a minute here. Is that, or is that not the real Nathaniel? So uh, uh, you, you've got, uh, you at least know that WA2NAF is an active call sign and it's out there. Other than Thanks. that, uh, uh, nothing really else to re report. Uh, uh, and considering my health is now improving, I'm recovering, as they say in the military, after a successful mission. Glad to be here, boss. Take yeah. care, guys. Yeah. Seven three <laughs> back to net control. Well, and we okay. wish you the best in your recovery. Uh, next on the list, we have Jim uh, K four BSE. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, Mike, Jim, Mike, microphone. I was on a um, uh, net earlier this evening. We were talking about what we had done in ham radio this week, and I couldn't think of much of anything I'd done. And I try to think on this, and I can't think of much of anything I've done either. I did get the uh, website for the Grape Help. Uh, kind of, I got the information on it that I wanted, but I'm not real happy with the uh, presentation of the information. I may uh, dork with that a little bit at some point, too. But um, uh, at least it's there. And I determined that, uh, yeah, it was the op amp on my grape that is not, uh, uh, was not working. So I've got the old one pulled off and ready to put the new one on. I, um, I did a little bit of damage to the PC board, but I think I can recover from it. Um, but uh, otherwise, unfortunately, not a lot of progress to report. Well, fine business. And next on the list, we have Joe, W7LUX. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, your microphone's still muted. Yeah. I don't know how to get this thing to uh, stay on. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I've uh, been watching the grape collect data. Uh, it doesn't appear to be going anywhere, but... Um, uh, it is collecting data, been monitoring the list, and I uh, haven't seen anybody uh, raise any questions. Had one person who uh, had a similar result to my uh, rather wild uh, fluctuations on the uh, 25th of uh, last month. But uh, no questions on the, um, uh, on the, uh, uh, the email list. And let's see, my, uh, my system has been running for a number of days now and no crashes. Uh, the ESD part, that little tiny uh, SO23 gadget, how I got mine on, first of all, I, I couldn't get it on the, uh, 
uh, the first board, but I did stick it on a second board. And how I did that is I wet the one uh, ground uh, pad and slid it on there uh, from a piece of paper. I tried grabbing one of them in the, uh, with a pair of tweezers and it went jumping off somewhere. I'll never find that, I suspect. But uh, uh, I managed to get it into position uh, under a microscope and held it down with a, a very small screwdriver while I applied just enough heat to get that ground connection uh, welded to the, or soldered to the, uh, the ground terminal. And then I went ahead and soldered the other two. But uh, that was my technique for getting it on there. Slid it on the, uh, on the board under the microscope and held it in place with a uh, very small screwdriver, a jeweler screwdriver, while I uh, uh, soldered the, uh, the one connection. Uh, let's see, uh, 10 meters and 6 meters, Braddock Key, it's that time of year. So I'm not surprised we're having uh, good conditions, even, uh, even in the wee hours of the morning. And uh, field day, been working on field day antennas here. A uh, girlfriend wants to go out and set up a portable station. So uh, she's recovered pretty much from the uh, uh, hip replacement surgery and been working on uh, getting coax and such for field day antennas. Uh, I manage uh, ARES around here. So uh, I pay particular attention. And right now we've just entered fire season and Yavapai County, the county to the uh, southwest of me, already has a uh, pretty good size fire, a 3,200 uh, acre fire going uh, between them and uh, Maricopa County where, uh, where Phoenix is. But uh, if I'm not here, it's probably because I'm out uh, helping with um, ARES type duties. Thanks, Dave. Well, fine business and uh, stay safe. Uh, next on the list, we have Jonathan, KC3 EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, there were two, two um, questions that I, I was thinking about uh, with my board. The uh, first one would be um, the uh, analog voltage. The IOVDD has to be 1.8 volts. Um, so um, I was going to use uh, 1.8 volts of ABDD also. And I was wondering about um, any opinions or remarks about using 1.8 volts as the ABDD as opposed to 3.3, um, which I had originally planned when I was gonna use 3.3 volts IOBDD. Um, the um, other thing that I was thinking about was the um, uh, clock distribution um, so to my knowledge, as I understand it, the differential clock will come into a driver. The output of that driver will connect to the input of a uh, differential to single ended converter to drive the um, ADD converter. And then um, that differential output um, also will connect to the input of a um, of another differential driver, and then drive the output to the FPGA. And, and I just wanted to know if if I understood that right, uh, just so I could kind of proceed with things. Uh, other than that, my graduation ceremony comes up in two weeks. I'm fairly excited about that. Um, back to the net. Well, congratulations, Jonathan. Uh, I'm glad you're getting to the graduation ceremony and hopefully they'll have it in person. And uh, next on the list, we have Michael, AA8K. Comments, Michael? Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, Joe, that's, uh, that's what I like to call the tiddlywink effect. <laughs> a, little, a little SMT just will jump away. Um, <laughs> I like, to, I like to spread out a uh, white towel <laughs> on the work area, and it tends to catch some of that stuff without uh, letting it rebound too badly. Uh, greetings to everyone listening. Back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. Next on the list is Scotty, W2, WA2DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> 
not a lot of, uh, well, I won't say not a lot of progress, not a lot of interesting things happening this week, but uh, still doing pin swapping and routing on the, uh, the data engine. And it looks like we're going to have to uh, change the ethernet chip because they are giving me a 2022 delivery date and I can't find any of them. So I'm not gonna wait till 2022 to build this thing. So <clears throat> I think we're gonna migrate from a three port ethernet chip to a five port ethernet chip of which I can get. The only problem is it's a 128 pin package from a 64 pin package. So my CAD guy is gonna be ripping his hair out, but I think we have enough room in the, it's in the upper left corner of the board. I think we have enough room to change the part to a 128. So uh, I'm gonna to talk to him tomorrow about doing that. And um, then we'll uh, be able to buy pretty much all the parts that the remaining one I can't get or I'm having trouble getting is a September delivery. Uh, a lot of the other ones that have been giving me um, August deliveries, July and August deliveries, they show up on my porch. So they're, they're here. <clears throat> so um, aim into that. I'll take them early if you give them to me early. <laughs> no problem with that. So um, let's see. That's, that's about it for the, uh, for the build. It's actually looking really good. The CAD guy is doing an awesome job in uh, routing and making things look really clean and not cross over. And uh, I think it's going to turn out to be a nice and quiet board if we can uh, keep this up. He's, he's almost done. He's, he's probably more, I'm going to say, two iterations. And each iteration is about uh, 25 to 30 signals that I have to move around. And uh, when he's done with that, then we're done, except for the rip up and reroute of the uh, gigabit port. And I tell you what, if I could find a way to put two more Ethernet jacks on the thing, I put four ports on the board because we're going to have five on the part. So it seems a shame to just no connect them to anything, but there's just not enough room around the outside of the board to put another dual ethernet port. And besides that, I'm not sure what we would actually do with it anyway. So anyway, that's it for here. So back over to you, Dave. Well, fine business. And next on the list, we have Tom in 5EG. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, good evening, Dave. It's uh... Oops, let me uh, get the video button there. It's been a pretty busy week. We've got uh, the Open HPSDR GNU radio driver ported to 3.9 successfully this morning and got the code uh, pushed up to GitHub. The final Yay. problem turned out to be a PyBind 11 version problem. And uh, I think the GNU radio instructions were at one time correct. Uh, asking you to install a particular version, but they're now no longer correct. And so the version that GNU Radio is built against uh, is different than the version that they asked you to install. So we got all that settled, got the right, right stuff version, and I did a brief test this morning. So the code's up and available, it seems to be working. So back to the group. Tom, yours is 3.9, right? Yes, 3.9.1. Good. Good. And uh, I was just wondering. Uh, I also wanted to mention something that happened over the weekend that uh, we should all be aware of is uh, John Ackerman gave a talk to GNU. Uh, it was the monthly GNU radio talk. And he did a really nice job. And he talked about his Eclipse data that he collected and some new the new radio uh, modules that he uh, developed to read that uh, eclipse data and some analysis he did of it. So if you haven't seen that, I'd highly recommend going and finding that video and uh, watching it. He did a really nice job. And he mentioned both Tangerine SDR, Tapper, and Hamsai. So all we all got plugged. <laughs> also on there, John leaked that DCC will be virtual. And uh, the president of GNU Radio said that they were going to be in person. And they weren't sure exactly if they were going to stay in the same place or not. So, so go figure. We're out of so, faith again. We'll, we'll 
uh, link up again with them sometime. So anyway, I just thought I'd pass all that on because it is relevant to our project. So we're open for general discussion, sorry. Oh, so I'd just like to say hi to Brian, 82 BA. Uh, I'm an RPI graduate from 1975. Brian's muted. Hi, <clears throat> sorry about that. I am also an RPI graduate of 2018 with my doctor and then they hired me back in a different school. So which school are you teaching out of? So I'm in ITWS now and I did my doctoral work over in Haas and STS. Okay, I'm not familiar with any of those acronyms being a uh, 50 year old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's been, it's been a long time since I've been to RPI, so. It's been a long time, yeah. So ITWS, that's our information technology and web science department. Okay. Um, I guess nominally we're, we're within the School of Science, but we have a degree of independence outside of the School of Science, which is, is quite nice. Um, and if you have heard of the Tetherless World Constellation that RPI has, um, we are somewhat aligned with them. They're the semantic web people. Um, they're okay. the ones who are thinking about how to make the web machine readable. Of course, none of that existed when I graduated, so. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we had an IBM 370 in the, the uh, I don't know what building it was called. It was across, it was on the, the main campus there, across from like the green building. Uh, I don't know church? if it, I don't know where the computer center is now, but it it's in like... the VCC now. It's in that old converted church. Okay. <laughs> Supercomputers on the top floor of that building. It's right across from the library. When you walk out the library, you're looking at it. Okay. Yeah, this is way on toward the west on the main campus was where the computer used to be. With the uh, sculpture that uh, had these two flat things that went around in opposite directions. And uh, it, it, they paid a fortune for this kinetic sculpture and it did not like ice. And you know what our guy, <laughs> ice is everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's that's real unfortunate if it did not like ice. <laughs> the first winter, it, one of the pieces was on the ground. And after that, I don't think it ever worked again. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. It's like, a, maybe you should consider a static sculpture, you know, a place that gets ice storms. <laughs> yeah. They have a... They have a little kinetic sculpture now. It's it's not all that big, and it manages to survive the winters just fine. Okay, yeah, this is about so, twenty feet tall, so it was. No, uh, this is more like ten feet tall. I think they may have learned their lesson. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brian, can you give us a little clue? What kinds of projects you're? I mean, things you're interested sure. so about? I I'm more or less still new to to amateur radio. I only got licensed back in July. Um, really, the only notable thing I did was write a QEX article that's in the, the current edition of QEX on uh, really it's just kind of my first attempt at a protocol for binary transfer over CW. Um, okay. I come from an old school Unix background. Um, I'm a BSD Unix developer and have been okay. for the better part of a decade. Um, I teach the cybersecurity courses here at RPI. Uh, I also teach some web development courses um, here as well in our department. So I also just have had a long standing interest in citizen science generally. Um, so part of my doctoral work um, was working with people who are embedded in doing citizen science projects. And so I've just always kind of been been interested in that. Some of my research work when I was a graduate student was was doing citizen science work. Mm. Um, and then I met David Kazin. Um, yeah. He reached out to me just correspondence for my QEX article and said, by the way, have you heard of, of, of HAMSI? You might be interested. So I said, no, I haven't. And that's kind of silly on my part because, you know, I, I spend a lot of time doing citizen science. So I'll go check it out. And so I signed up for the mailing list saw the email for this this morning and, and figured show up beer right so, so do you belong to w2s ed to the club i do not belong to the club um you know as far as i know the club is 
silent, but that may have changed. It's been silent for the last year. Um, WRPI has also been silent. I think it only just recently became unsilent. I think the FCC actually still thinks that WRPI is silent. I don't think they've updated their wow. their database about that. Right. It, and it's nothing about the students. It really was just kind of the results of of the current state of affairs around the world um, more than anything else. I was just curious because when I was there, SED was, oh, they probably had between 50 and 100 members and it was a very active club in the VHF contest and everything. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how many recruits we could get for HAMSI out of the W2SZ group if they're active still. But if they're kind of on, I know university radio clubs tend to go up and down with uh, how many students there are who are active at that time and then they graduate and then there's nobody. Yes. And, right. And I think part of it too is, you know, in the fall we're supposed to be back to normal, whether or not that's true, we'll see. Um, but presuming I would imagine things being back to normal in the fall would also just kind of help grow the numbers again because right the students will be there they'll be close to the station and and life will be a lot a lot more easier for them in that so, regard so you've been shut down for the past year we have been doing what we are nominally calling hybrid for the past year which was i would have let's say I had a class of 40 students i'd have 20 of them in person right in front of me in the classroom and the other 20 online simultaneously okay because the last I heard at RPI, they basically, uh, the, the university kicked out all the residents. They did. We kicked everybody out um, right after spring break last year. And we transitioned entirely online for the remainder of last spring. And then we've done this whole year of this kind of half and half model, which I guess has been, you know, the best that could be done given the, the circumstances, but I'm really kind of looking forward to having all those students back in person. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Thanks for the update. I haven't been to RPI in ages. And, you know, I still remember the, uh, the, the lectures with, you know, two or 300 people and then the recitations with 20 or 30. And- uh, Yep, they still do that here. Yeah. And is it is the physics uh, lecture still uh, the magic show, or was it before the shutdown? Uh, you know, I don't know. I was never I was never close to the phys physics department. Okay, the physics the physics lectures were the guys the physics professors always had some magical exploding uh, burning uh, you know some kind of spectacular thing to show uh, us. <laughs> no, I've been here for six years. I've never heard of that. So okay, uh, things have changed. Must, must be gone. Yeah, that's too bad. It that was always the, good though. <laughs> it was the magic show, and it was always we always they it, it kept attendance up though because you never knew what they were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'll just mention I did a little research on W2S said the license is still good until 2025, and I will point out that there is a. Uh, group for college um, amateur radio stations that if you're interested you might get involved with yeah i know i have a handful of students who are licensed themselves and i've asked them about w2sz and they just kind of tell me things have been quiet we haven't really been having meetings but that's because nobody's on campus yeah that that's certainly going to be true yeah um at Dartmouth, we have a, a college radio club as well, but uh, it's been re re pretty inactive because we don't have a lot of undergraduates with licenses, but there are a number of us um, well, professors and staff who keep it alive. It, Nathaniel's trying to get the Scranton club going. Yeah, we're working on it. So we have a good little core of uh, students that I've gotten interested and now I'm just trying to get some antennas on the building and I think it'll happen, but you know, there are some, a few challenges with that, but I'm working on it. Um, got some antennas up at my house, which is not that far. And um, we've done a lot uh, remotely, even uh, during the pandemic uh, using the Kiwi SDRs. Um, so you could go to kiwisdr.com and you can do shortwave listening with that. And that's worked out really nicely with the uh, students. So you need any antennas, Nathaniel? Do I need any antennas? 
for um, the university? I've got, yeah, I've got a couple of three beams laying around that uh, have been laying around for years that have, could see some use. <laughs> so if you need any mono banders. Yeah, uh, if I could, I mean, that would be nice. I have the room to put them up at my house, but um, <laughs> and I, I think the, I think the, um, the tower maintenance is scaring us right now. <laughs> yeah, so I know it. At ASU, it was it, they went to uh, uh, like certified climbers only. Yeah, so that means it's just and, tremendously expensive. Right, and that's that's even to put modest antennas up right now. It's horrendously expensive, um, but I'm I'm working on it. So we'll we just go out there on the weekend when no one's around. And oh, well, geez, I look, I know work. I know NJIT. They have their two towers up. It was installed by in the '70s by students with a gin pole. So yeah, you know, don't think that happens anymore. Hope, hope you don't drop the antenna through the roof or something because yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to move out of state. Yeah. By the yeah. way, um, I'll mention that our trusty um, um, uh, shoot. Now I just lost his name, Hanson. Um, uh, K K A two V U N. I think. Um, anyway, Eric Hanson. Um, he actually teaches SDR in his uh, um, digital electronics class. So we might be able to tag him and his students for little help when uh, the, this project um, gets going and needs a little bit more FPGA help. It's an, by the way, that's another part that I have on the short list. I don't have any FPGA delivery date yet. And without an FPGA, we don't have much of anything. So, can you use a slower part, at least to develop? I uh, everything's twelve weeks lead time. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not convinced that asking. In fact, I might actually get it sooner asking for the oddball part. Yeah, that makes sense. You mm. Just, but the thing is that the 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 procedure here is so long and convoluted, because being a, a an Altera slash Intel partner, we have to go through all the proper channels to get the part uh, approved. I mean, it's been on the list for as the part we're going to use for like a year, more than a year. But we have to go through to get the pricing, and then we have to go through and get the quote from the distributor, and then we got to get the lead time from the distributor, and then we have to actually place the order before my rep can actually do anything to expedite, because he can only expedite orders. He can expedite, maybe I'll buy one. And I can't place an order until I get a price. And I haven't been able to, and, and I get a, a projected price from the rep, but I don't buy them from the rep. I buy them from the distributor. So the distributor has to agree to that price and agree to sell it to me for that price. And then I place the order. And then I can go to my rep and say, okay, 12 weeks is unacceptable. How about uh, next week? And then we fight over where he can scarf up some parts. And it turns complicated. Out it, right. Yeah, and it turns out it's interesting because we use uh, uh, five, five regulators. We use five regulator chips from Empyrean, which is owned by Intel, at least for a little while longer. They sold the, uh, the division off, but it hasn't gone through yet. The, the approvals haven't gone through. But uh, they're quoting me 12-week lead time and the same exact price I can get from DigiKey, who has them in stock. So it's like... Um, we didn't buy through the distributor or that that distributor because I'm not going to wait 12 weeks for a part. I can just go and order and get delivered in two days. So anyway, all the regulators are, I have them already. They're here. And in fact, we have pretty much all the parts, but this is my parts list here, my non-parts list, the ones I don't have. And there's only four parts on it, but it's the Ethernet chip, it's the USB 3 chip, it's the FPGA, and it's the high performance crystal oscillator. Those are the four parts that I can't get. And the crystal yes, oscillator, I'm supposed to be able to get, it's just I can't get the, the, I'm talking to the sales guy and he can't get the factory to talk to him. And all their parts are like, uh, they're semi custom because they're built to, to certain frequencies. And I even told the guy, hey, look, any frequency between 48 and 52 megahertz will work. Mm -hmm. What what do you what standard what what you what do you make for some other someone else? Won't talk to me. Uh, what sort of oscillator are we talking about here? It's, it's made by Raycon. 
And now, what's it, special about it? It's special is extremely low phase noise. Ah. And expensive, but you know, that's regular old package or is it some custom no, package? No, yeah, it's a um it's okay, so it's weird. It's a, it's a QFN package, but it is a crystal oscillator mounted on an FR4 substrate which has the QFN pins around it and then some extra components around it. So it's kind of like a hybrid Right. So it, I think that's part of the reason it makes it so expensive. I don't know why they did it that way, but maybe for heat isolation. I, so what's the nominal frequency that you really do want? Um, 48 to 52. I'd, I'd, but it doesn't matter. I said 50. So uh -huh. something pretty common, right? 50 megahertz. So but it's a, unrelated to our 122.88. No, because it'll be... Of that. No, now what it does is it is the oscillator that runs into the synthesizer chip. And the synthesizer chip uses that oscillator for its low phase noise properties and looks at the timing of that with respect to the 10 meg reference to decide when the 10 meg reference has gone out of, out of bounds or out of block and to do holdover. Uh -huh. So we could theoretically use virtually any frequency. I'm hoping that they come back with a 50 or a 48 or a 52 or something nice and even, not like a 49.123865, you know, and I, right. I don't know what that, where that came from. Or if they yeah. come up with something that's divisible by 48 kilohertz, you know, that would, I mean, I don't know what they would have. And I don't care, but it doesn't really matter what I ask for. If they don't talk to me, I, I'm not going to get anything out of them. And, and John Ackerman has gotten samples of, uh, and Tom, I don't know what you know what frequency he got. He, it seems like it was 32 megahertz. Uh, I don't remember. It has to be between 48 and 52 to run the chip. So if you have samples, they won't run the chip. Well, what what oh, you probably don't know the answer to this. I'm trying to figure out what the samples were for the evaluation board that uh, that he made. Because I've got Raycon parts for that, and I don't know what frequency they are. They got some yeah, numbers. The, st the standard engineering about boards use 48 megahertz. Okay. At any rate, I've got five samples of those, and we're building the evaluation board. And you guys might not have heard about this, but uh, Tom, I mean, uh, John Ackerman and Rick Hambly have designed an evaluation board that takes the, the pieces that are not on the Silicon Labs board that has a synthesizer chip that we use and puts the, the parts that we use on our clock module on a separate board. So now when you marry the, the board that you buy from Silicon Labs with the synthesizer on it and this extra evaluation board, now you get the oscillator chain exactly the same as what we have on the clock module. So we'll be able to actually test the real chips because we've been using a different synthesizer and a different oscillator and a different this and a different that, and we're getting approximate uh, idea of what it's gonna be like. But when this evaluation board is done, we'll know exactly what it's like because it'll be the same parts that we use. So, um, and since uh, we're all busy with other stuff, I'm taking the boards actually over this. Uh, this is the parts kit right here, which you can't see because of my fine business background. But um, let me show you this. I'll turn off the uh, background so you can see the junk in my, uh, in my room. So this is the module, this is the board. And those uh, up by my, my index finger and, the, and along the bottom here, those are edge launch SMAs. And the SMAs come off here and here and they mate perfectly with the Silicon Labs board. So you can just hook it up with barrel connectors and uh, you can mate the boards together. That's pretty cute. So. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be nice when they when we get it done. And uh, since, like I said, since nobody seems to have any time, we opted to have the same CM who's gonna build all of our boards. He's going to uh, assemble this, and we got the quote, and everything is all approved. Tapper's gonna pay for it, and uh, and we'll get it back in like a week, and it'll be done. Scotty, I'd like to ask a question about your Ethernet dilemma. Sure. Um, 
the original plan was a three port board or a three port chip and you were going to bring all three ports out one port goes to the fpga and two ports come out that was the original the original two two five ports and one mac port that goes okay so you were basically feeding just a single gig e to all three ports from the fpga well it, it appears as to the fpga it appears as a mac so we, it looks like an FP, uh, an Ethernet, one Ethernet port. And then, but it goes into a switch fabric so that we can send it out of either port. So, it, I mean, it shows up on one Ethernet bus since there were only three. Now, since this is a five port. What I was thinking about is possible future link aggregation, but if you're limited to a single lane, basically to the FPGA, that really doesn't help. Yeah, and, and the, uh, the one, for which for the ksz yeah oh just gotta you have to check these things every day uh nona just said that uh the it's latest fun, delivery right? for the ksz part now is december 14th at least it's in 2021 and not in 2022 <laughs> so that's, that's the latest date or the that's that's the, latest, that's the one that, you, that the, she just got most upgraded it they they've been moving the date up a little bit at a time okay so it what used to be like uh, mid 2022, and uh, now it's December 2021. That's so an improvement. It's an improvement. So, but, but wow. I, but I'm thinking uh, the thing about the uh, the seven port or the the six port one, if we can squeeze it in, it uses a a GMII interface instead of an RGMII. And for those of you who don't know what that is, an RGMII is called a reduced gigabit mac interface so it uses four transmit bits and four receive bits so they send a nibble out at a time which means to get gigabit speeds you got to send at 125 megahertz and you got to go double data rate right so you've got to you got to basically clock at 250 megahertz to get a gigahertz out right because you get four bits at a time so at 125 megahertz that's only 500 megabits per second so you got a double data rate, which means you got to send data out on each edge of a 125 megahertz clock, which is just, this is the reason we need a dash six part, okay? Now, if I use this part here, it has a GMII interface, which is eight bits, transmit eight bits received, which means you still use 125 megahertz clock, but you clock only on one edge. So it's conceivable I could use a slower speed grade FPGA and this GMII, although I'm a little nervous because the uh, A to Ds have to be clocked to DDR also, and they go at 122.88, which is pretty darn close to 125. So I would keep the high speed FPGA in order to do that. Yeah, the receiver has got a double data rate interface, so it's effective. Uh, data rate is 245 megabits per pin. Right. But the thing is, we can use um, uh, the differential. Um, yeah, the, the differential signaling uh, really helps a lot, plus quieting things down. And it's LVDS, so it's, it's a lower swing, so it's much lower noise. And the, the uh, Ethernet is not, it's single-ended, so... It's uh, no, no opportunity to do LVDS or differential with that. But I can go to eight bits and do half the data rate, which is, that seems to be highly desirable. Although I will have to come up with an extra eight data pins, four transmit and four receive to connect up to it. But I think that's worth the headache that that's gonna entail. Yeah, the noise is less when you've got the sender and receiver chips on the same circuit board, not going through a connector. Yeah, but yeah. That helps a bunch. And you, and, well, the, the question is, you don't really have any real estate to bring the additional ports out. Is that what you were saying before? Right. I don't have any edges to bring it out. I mean, I the, the top edges are have the uh, RF for the uh, RF modules. The left edge is where we bring everything out. It's pretty much full. The bottom edge is where the connectors are for the RF boards that have our, their RF out the top. And the right-hand side is the upper right is has the 40 pin uh, Raspberry Pi compatible connector. So that comes right up to the edge and the board will, the right edge of the Raspberry Pi hat 
aligns with the right edge of the board. So you can't put anything along there because it would interfere. So theoretically, I guess I could put something to the at the bottom right, but the problem is that's diagonally opposite to where the, the gigabit part is. So yeah. the only only alternative would be to move the entire gigabit interface over to the right hand side of the board and put all of the ports over there. Yep, Scotty. Yeah. Scotty. Yeah. You know, um, a single port Ethernet chip um, to me seems like a, a possible fallback solution because a five port giggy switch, you know, they're down in the $10, $15 range now. So it wouldn't be beautiful, but, you know, it's pretty cost effective to have an external uh, well, five port the, switch. The three port switch that we had is about uh, $2 less than the six port one. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the cost of the chips is the same. The real estate is bigger because it's a 128 pin package. Well, yeah, but but if we can't get them. <laughs> no, I can get the six port one. I can't get the three port one. So you use the six port one, you just d d don't connect three ports. So. I assume you could configure them to just be dead ports. Just configure them to be dead ports or don't connect anything to them. Yeah. And so I. You know, I, 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 Tom, I did think about, yeah, just, just put a single phi on there and just have a single port. Okay, that would work also. But there was a definite advantage to having two ports. You don't need a switch to connect to your local network and to the Raspberry Pi. So, so it seems if, I, if we could get this on here, that would be okay. It's just, like I said, it seems a waste to have a five port switch and use two of the ports. <laughs> you know, it's like you need three node connects and it's like, wow, what should I do with these? Can I put a header on there? Can I put a daughter card on there with the extra ethernet? Well, the, the, the link back to the, the FPGA though is still a, just a single link. So even if you had multiple ports, you'd be spreading the bandwidth out. It, it won't help you as far as throughput at all, no. Right. It just would be a gimmick. You know, that you could, and I looked for a triple high Ethernet jack and I couldn't find any. So I'm, we're using a double high one now, but they make three side by sides, but they don't make double, they don't make triple height ones. You can only get double heights. Although what I did find was I found one that had an Ethernet port in the top and a USB port in the bottom. So yeah, that's pretty common these days occurred to me I could use a dual Ethernet on one jack, which is what we have, replace the USB port with an Ethernet USB combo, and I'd at least get three ports then instead of five, so I'd only be wasting two ports. But really, I mean, for the $2 difference in price cost of the IC, waste the ports. doesn't matter. And then I get a slower interface that's easier to interface to. So that's worth something. Is it worth $2? Worth $2 and the headache of it's actually the $2 doesn't bother me near as much as the hundreds of dollars I'm going to have to pay the CAD guy to rip that up. Yeah. It's already routed. And of course, he's already routed that part. <laughs> so it's go figure, you know, it wouldn't, have, wouldn't be in the area that he hasn't done. He's, he's doing the uh, RF modules right now. So, and, and Tom, we're going to have to change something on the RF board because um, I can't give you 1.8 volts. I don't have a 1.8 volt regulator. So, and yeah, uh, well, I'm not using 1.8 volts on the board. Is I wait a minute? Yes, I do the digital. I'm using them for the digital inter inputs. Right. And so you use the VCCIO, which I am giving you, which would be 1.8, except now we've determined that to do LVDS, we have to strap it to 2.5. So now I and I, I can't give you 2.5. I mean, I can give you 2.5, but it's not going to be what you need. So what I was thinking is we would take that 1.8 digital regulator that's on the board that you have already. That's, yeah. it, it's uh, like those um, LD1117 regulators. It's in the little tab type package. Mm -hmm. And if we took that off and replaced it with two 1.8 volt regulators that are in the JSON package. They would be the same size as that package, and so they would fit. And then you would have the analog and the digital, and you'd have to you'd have to add some filter caps and things like that. 
So we're going to have to talk about that. And what you're just going to have to generate your own 1.8 locally is the way I think it's going to have to work. Okay. Well, we generated it for the analog just to, to make it a low noise uh, right. source. All right. Well, um, just uh, let me, when you, when you've settled down all the issues, let me know and we can go back and revisit it. Because I'm, I'm presuming that you're probably going to want to have a separate regulator for that digital to keep the noise off the analog part, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the noise on the 1.8 volt analog input is, uh, you know, has got to be pretty low. Yeah. And so then the only issue that I can find is um, the three pins that are the I2C port that goes to the main connector. They're the 1.8 volt I2Cs. The, the main control for the 3.3 volt I2C for the uh, port expander that runs the relays, that's yeah. fine. That's, that's fine. That stays the same. But this is the one that goes to the A to D converter. OK, I haven't looked at the schematic in probably a year. Yeah. So it's I, just that, 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 that port. It's just that that port now is going to be 2.5 volts, and that will not work with the 1.8 volt regular or, uh, A to D. The absolute maximum rating is two volts on those IOs. So, but it's just an I2C. So I think we could come up with an I2C level translator just to yeah, do I, an I2C port. I think a resistor and a shot key diode could do it. Yeah, yeah. So that, but that's the only thing I can come up with that'll that will have to change that 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 voltage regulator and the I two C port levels. Okay. Well, um, go ahead and finish up uh, the the data engine because uh, it should be quick for us to re revisit the receiver. Okay. And it looks like down in that area where the uh, regulator is, there's some air, there's some room. So we might just luck out and it'll be easy to fit in. Okay. Um, well, you know, there's. Uh, any board that has open real estate is a, is a waste, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well put something there. <laughs> we'll have to move the logo though, because that was where we had the logo because it was open. <laughs> so. Well, just just stencil the logo on the top of the connector. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll point out Jonathan had a couple of questions for the VLF card. Oh, that's right. Right. So Jonathan, explain to me again about the clock. I was, I was trying to pay attention, but I, I didn't. Yeah, the, the clock he had right, the way we had discussed it before, where he brings the clock on differential to single-ended, uses it internally, and then sends it back out single-ended to differential. Okay, and it'll be LVDS, the differential will be each LVDS, way. Yeah. Each way. And then right. however you use it on the board, that's however you want Right. So I think the idea there is there are, um, you can get a single receiver, single tran uh, transmitter um, in a single chip. But so the, just the whole, the whole point of that though, was to keep the data coming back from him and the clock coming back synchronized. From synchronous. So right. I can use the clock. So, the clock yeah, so if we do that, he can use a um, single transceiver chip that has a receiver and a transmitter in the same one just loop it back on itself and use the single ended signal to drive the ADC. Then, then am I not going to be one buffer delay uh, between the data that I get and the clock? No, shouldn't be. We're talking fairly low uh, clock rates here. So no, you should be all, it should be all set. Okay. Well, I thought we were talking like 50 megahertz clock rate. Is that not right? Yeah, but the propagation delays shouldn't be a problem. I mean, you're trying to keep it synchronous. That's the way you're going to have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you feed, if you take the differential into the board and you run it into a buffer to get single-ended out and run the, the codex with that and then take that single-ended and feed it into a buffer that goes back to me, I'm going to be one buffer to lay off from the, the data. Oh, um, yeah, well, the, the propagation delay for the receiver plus the transmitter. But I thought that's how you wanted it. What I want is the clock synchronous with the data, if that's possible. And it, it, it is if the chip gives me a clock. Like, for instance, on the receiver board, the A to D converter actually has a clock output that is synchronous with the data output, which is ideal. But these codecs don't have that. Yeah, and, and in actuality, 
you want on the receiver, the clock needs to be shifted half a bit time off, right? Because you you use one edge to clock to, to sample. Um, right. No, actually, you do it the other way around. You let the the um, you have it all happening on the same clock edge. Well, that's DDR from the receive. So you got a clock on both edges. Um, at any rate, and the, and the receiver it doesn't matter. It's well, all programmable. You can slide the clock around. Uh, yeah, but you need it. audio codecs don't use DDR. Right. right. Typically, you know, in most it's just pipeline. You, the receiver samples on the middle, on the middle clock edge, not on this on the changing clock edge. No, we sample on the far on the same edge. Okay. From my experience. Well, in, yeah, in that case, if the edge is too darn close, you, you uh, rely the day, on the propagation of the driver, data driver, to satisfy hold time. Right. In which case, this is not. This should not be an issue. Correct. We'll have to look at the timing, but it shouldn't be an issue. And you I, can either, you know, if we have it, have that uh, transceiver on the in the design. We can wire it whichever way we want, whichever works. The second question he had was uh, 1.8 volts versus 3.3. And the core of the uh, ADC does run off 1.8. But I thought it ran on 1.8 or 3.3 and- it You can supply it with 3.3. It has an internal regulator to bring it down to the 1.8. Okay, so you're probably gonna use less power if you're running on 1.8. Correct. Not use the internal regulator. And his question was that he's going to run the I.O. at 1.8. So should we run the core? At well, he should run the I.O. At, at the VCC I.O. voltage that I give him. Which would be what? 1.8, 2.5, or 3.3. It may be any of the above, you're saying. Any of the above, depending on what the... Uh... Okay, so this is an independent question then. Yeah. And so, you said something about not having 1.8 volts to, to feed yeah. other boards? Well, okay. So the way the regulators are set up is I have a regulator for each RF module. And it is strappable to 1.8, 2.5, or 3.3, each of them. Mm -hmm. So I supply a VCCIO to RFM0 and RFM1 independently. But that's the only place those regulators supply. And I have no 1.8 volts used anywhere else in the system. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have a 1.8 volt regulator that I can supply, even though on the RF module, we, we had a pin called 1.8 volts, but it's really VCC IO and it's, right. it's RF I see. zero. So zero. that is, that's, and the point is that that's an indeterminate voltage at this right. time. So it better run. So you can't three. use that to supply a core of a chip. You can't use it unless. I unless was, you it, had a, I was, a regulator that was. Right, right. Uh, well, first I was figuring he'd use it for the VCCIO of the chip because that will run on all three of those voltages. And it really doesn't matter what they are as long as the other side of the receiver transmitter is on the same voltage. Yeah. And that's, well, the, way, that's the reason he gets VCCIO is because the bank that that port is connected to yeah. is running on that VCCIO. So you need to be on that VCCIO also. Yeah, I would say probably you're going to feed for the core operation of the board probably feed at 3.3 and we would just use its internal regulator yeah. okay because jonathan you get 3.3 and 5 volts so you can do whatever you like with those it's just that if you're going to talk to the io you got to talk at the vccio voltage that i give you right because that's the way it's going to be connected well what well, is that is 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 that voltage finalized yet or, or or is that still up in the it's, air it's strappable so it'll be selectable uh, on the data engine so it has to run on any of the three so then um so you can't then, depend upon it being any particular one of those three voltages yeah so we need to have that card be versatile so just run that in separately from the actual um, supply voltage to the card. Yeah, because I'm figuring you're just going to take the VCCO that I give you and you're going to filter it and you're going to run it. It's digital. So then it's not going to be, noise is not going to be an issue. You're going to create your own analog voltages for your RF and your analog. Yeah. But the digital side will be, will come from 
the, a pin on the connector. No, but 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 what what I'm what I'm saying is that is is that the digital voltage finalized? Do we know what it, what it's going to be? Or it's one point eight, two point five, or three point three. It's but, selectable in operation of the card. But Jonathan, it doesn't matter to the supply to the um, ADC because it's not available as a um, as the main power supply. Well, right. No, I, I, I was just. And it doesn't matter if you have one point eight on the I/O. Doesn't matter that the analog core is also one point eight. It's going to be want to be a different source anyway because it's the analog core, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you're being sent three point three volts and the chip has an onboard regulator that is known quiet, use it. Okay, because 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 if if we could strap the I/O voltage to three point three volts then I was going to run the IOVDD at 3.3 and I was going to run the analog also at 3.3. They're, they're not related. They do not get connected. You do not oh, want right. analog no, no, connected no, 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 to digital. That. Yeah, no, 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 I know. But, but what, what, I was, what, what I was asking was is um, if if I have to use 1.8 volts, which, well, um, what I was asking was, is there any benefit to running different voltages or should I just stick with the same voltage level for both the analog and, and, and the digital? They're not related. They're different. They're completely different. They're orthogonal. Well, right, right. So, so then, then, then it technically doesn't matter. I can doesn't pick whatever I want. It doesn't matter. But like, like David said, if you have a low noise three point three volt to one point eight volt onboard regulator, use that, and supply the the core with three point three volts, on from your, either filtered off the connector or from your onboard three point three volt regulator. And then supply the VCCIO from the VCCIO pin that I give you. Right. And it'll be one of the three voltages, but you don't care because the core voltage will be fixed and you will decide what that is. The VCCIO will not be fixed and you will decide, you, you won't decide what it is. You'll take whatever I give you and that'll be whatever the user decides to, to strap the strap it to. And at this point, it's likely to be two and a half volts because that looks like where we're going to have to strap RFM zero to make it work. Yeah, we're going to well, have to look at the chip to see what it wants. It, well, I looked at it, and it, it will take 1.8, 2.5, or 3.3 as the VCC IO. No, 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 no. It only, I, it only takes um, um, 1.8 or 3.3. Yeah, I don't see 2.5 in it. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say is they only specify 1.8 or 3.3. Yeah. Now, why it wouldn't take an intermediate, I'm not sure, but I haven't that looked yeah. that deep into the data sheet yet. Well, and the thing about it is, is that the inputs to me that come into FPGA pins are 3.3 volt tolerant. Right. So if you set, if the VCCIO is set to 1.8 and you drive 3.3 volts to me, that will still work. Ah. But the problem is the other way. If you're set to 3.3 and I'm driving 1.8, I don't get high enough to give you a logic high. So, Correct. and I don't know if those um, inputs are 3.3 volt tolerant on the uh, codec. And actually come to think of it, are there really any inputs from the codec anyway? I mean, aren't they all outputs from the codec to the FDA? Yeah. yeah. Well, you got to program the codec though. Other than the I2C. But the I2C, I2C and, port is, does it run off the same VDDIO as the I2S port? Yeah. It does. Yeah. And then also the, the clocking is coming in. Yeah, and the clocking now, 
that's coming in, the VCCIO for the clock that comes to you, Jonathan, is set by you. So you actually send the VCCIO voltage to the clock module to tell it what voltage you want coming back. Okay. We'll so have to look at the clock chip to see what voltage you have to give it to get the desired IO standard coming back at you. Okay. Right. I, I, I remember you were saying that. Yeah. But, but if so, see, cause the thing is this, this coda can't use 2.5. That's why that I was concerned. Um, well, you know, it, okay. So on the clock seems to me, I have a, a separate clock set of pins going to this module. Let me see what I could do. Maybe we just don't use any of the VDDIO pins, the, the VDIO level pins to talk to you. We just use 3.3 volt. That would work, right? If everything was 3.3 volt? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so, so all, all, um, all digital has to be either 3.3 or 1.8. Now, since I'm going to get the, the uh, M clock signal from the um, um, from that uh, driver, um, it, or um, on the clock module, or um, well, no, I'm going to get it from the converter. So oh. there'll be the di differential of single ended converter. Oh, so, so you'll get you'll get something from the clock module at a voltage that you decide. And, yeah. you give it, and then you'll take that and convert it to whatever voltage you need for the codex. Yeah. And then you've got to send it back out to me at a voltage that I need, and we haven't determined that yet. So what I was saying is you could make that three volts, right? Well, right. Yeah. Well, well with that, with that, that uh, a dual, dual driver, I, I see that um, um, David mentioned, um, um, it'll, it'll just be uh, looped. So it, it, it'll, it'll go in, it'll loop, it'll go out to the FPGA, and then I'll just attach to that loop my um, differential to single-ended converter, and that'll be fed to the codec. And, and um, um, so, um, so, so we don't really have to worry about that other than uh, what we're sending back to the FPGA. I just have to make sure I get something back at a level that I can use. Yeah. Yeah, well, the simple thing would be to just um, say 3.3 volts. 3.3 volts differential? Well. So um, the differential standards aren't usually 3.3. So. No, no, I mean the you know, yeah, are you taking the data from the, from the ADC differential? No. Uh, yes. Oh. On the RF board, yes. It's LVDS, so it's differential. So, the the, so there has to be an LVDS converter transmitter the converting LV the... Uh, uh, data. The L LVDS goes right into the FPGA. It has LVDS receivers right on the pins. So right. I, I don't have any converters. I just so yeah. so this card is going to have to convert the single ended coming out of the ADC to LVDS. No, because it comes out of the ADC LVDS. The clock does. I get a clock and the data, all LVDS. But the but the data is not LVDS. Yes, it is. Out of the. No chip out of the rf out of the adc yeah it is well, uh, the, the the vlf one no 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 i'm talking about the rf module no but i'm talking about this one we're talking the design of the vlf card okay so on the vlf card if that's single that'll be single ended though right that correct yes. yeah. it's either 1.8 or 3.3 single ended right right okay. now are you going to need that being sent lvds um, depends on how I hook it up because on that card there are LVDS IOs and there's single ended IOs. So if there's enough single ended IOs, then I propose we just use those and okay. not mess with the LVDS ones. And then we don't right. have this level translation problem 
we just make it all three volts. And, and like you said, it's at a relatively low speed. So. Do you, right. you know how many single ended IOs? Well, that's it. I think there's only about five IOs, right? There's a, there's a, because, okay, so I'm going to get a clock from you and I'm going to have to give you the frame sync. And I'm going to. And the. Uh, basically the needs clock. a master clock, a frame sync, and a bit clock. Right, yeah. but there's two. Yeah, okay. And the bit clock and the uh, master clock are have a definite divider ratio associated with them based upon yeah. what you pick for the. How wide you pick for the ADCs and all that, right? Right. <laughs> but I don't think that they have a. A required phase relationship. We need to check that. Yeah, and I've looked and looked and looked, and I couldn't find any. Yeah, so I they're think internal it, synchronizers usually. There. Yeah. So the I2S port has to have the same number of clocks, but they don't have to be in any phase relationship with the data coming in. Right. Right. They they just have to be a multiple. A multiple, right? And, yeah. Right. It, so 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 with um. There's the shutdown pin, which I want to use. Right. Uh, um, that will come from the FPGA. Um, that'll go into the codec. And then the, um, the uh, frame sync and the bit clock, they also come from the FPGA in, into the codec. Um, and so far, that's three single-ended. And then we have the data output coming from the codec. So that's four single-ended um, so far. So is it only one pin or two pins? The uh, data output. Because um, remember on those AKN parts, it was, uh, you got two bits at a time. Right, so the, there's a GPIO that we're gonna be, that it could either be used as a second data output or a master clock input. So if we're using it as a master clock input, we're gonna use TDM and um, we won't have to worry about that. So, so so you're using that as a master clock input, right? You have to use it as a master clock input, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's how that we're gonna configure it. Yeah. So really that's only four pins then. Three yeah. outs and one in for the FPGA. Plus the the two I2C lines. Now, I'm going to have to look into this, but it may be that since that's an optional, that's a, it, it must be locking to the bit clock and F sync without that. So we may not need to send it anything more than bit clock and F sync. Right, but I have to know what bit clock to send it, and that's going to be a divide down from the master clock, right? Yeah. But I'm saying that it, it does, its internal master clock is phase locked to something else. Not the It has an internal PLL that's generating its master clock. And it comes off of what clock? That's what we need to look at. But if, yeah. if the GPIO pin is an optional PLL input clock source, that means that it also has the capability of just running off the uh, yeah, well, I know that I've read about one of the modes is an auto mode where it figures out what clock, what master right. clock to generate based upon your bit clock, right? Which means maybe he doesn't even need a master clock at all. I just give that's, him that clock and everything runs off of that. That's what I'm saying. We may just send well, it the F sync bit clock and it'll be just happy. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use that mode. Why not? Because, because I want to be able to feed the um, master clock. Because 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 with the mode that I'm going to use, um, it it's going to clock itself from 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 the master clock. That'll be the the lowest jitter clock. I don't want it, and so um, the other modes you could use the. Um, um, bit clock to clock it, and then it will it will generate 
or it will use its internal PLL as the master clock from the bit clock. So to, it'll look at the bit clock rate and decide what master clock rate the PLL should be set to, right? And it just sets it there. Or, or you, you tell it by I2C what rate, what multiply you want. Well, yeah, you, you, you uh, uh, tell it what, what the multiplier is. Um, that's why that I do believe that they have to be in phase with this mode. But there's really nothing to be in phase because if I supply only the bit clock and it generates the master clock, then it's responsible for making them in phase, not me, because I give it only one clock. Well, well, but well, it'll be an issue with the GPS. It'll be an issue with the time right. with the with um with the time time stamping. So this I don't is why wanna, you want to use the master clock, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to rely on the internal P, PLL, be, because that's going to cause error in the, in in the time stamps. That's why that I want to run off of. Have the, you have you seen a spec that uh, shows that it's being different? Well, um, I don't have I. Um, since I haven't been this one, this here, I'm reading the paragraph right here. Device yeah. uses an integrated load jitter phase lock loop to generate internal clocks required for the ADC modulator digital filter engine. The device also supports an option to use bit clock GPI01 or the GPIX pin as M clock as the audio clock source without using the PLL to reduce power consumption. However, the AD performance may degrade based on jitter from the external clock source. Well, and some processing features may not be supported. But you know, they're assuming that you're gonna give it a crummy clock and we're not gonna Well, do no, the point is that it's very difficult to supply said clock. So they have an onboard PLL that's as good as any clock you can give it. Well, is that true or is- That's I mean, what they're basically implying. <laughs> it, well, see, I, I was reading that. And... You would have to see, uh, um, I would have to see a spec that says that um, using a high quality external M clock is better than the onboard phase lock loop to say that that's a good idea, but this is basically implying don't do it unless you really know what you're doing. Well, we know what we're doing. Well, I mean, in terms of- <laughs> Yeah, I know what you Yes, mean. but- <laughs> Well, it is, well, um, did you notice- The a... internal phase lock loop is gonna be as good as anything you can supply it, I would think. I don't, it's not, they're saying that ADC, per, ADC performance may degrade based on using an external clock source. But, but they're saying it'll degrade. That's just, Why would we well, that's just because go to the know, hassle? They know what the performance of their clock is. They don't know what the performance of the external clock you give them is. So it may degrade if you give them the crappy clock, but we're not giving them a crappy clock. We're gonna give them a high quality clock from the clock module. But the chip is designed to generate its own high quality clock. Well, maybe we... This might be a, a question for an applications engineer at TI. Or but my suspect, be... I suspect that um, the, they're saying the only reason to use an external clock is to reduce power consumption, not to improve performance. Well, maybe we rig it up so we can do it either way. And we could, we yeah. Decide. But well, well, I mean, there's a part of me that says, keep it simple. Yeah. But I'm well, thinking that there's probably not a lot of uh, of um, aggravation or, or complexity that you add to just take the master clock that I'm supplying already from the clock module and use that one. Because it seems like you could feed that in and then you could program it to not use that. Right, and yes, you, that's true. We could put it in there and try it both ways. And in fact, you can go to the clock module and turn it off if you don't want it spewing all over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that would be okay. But this thing is a 120 dB dynamic range part. They're not going to put in a PLL that degrades that. Well, well the, no. The internal no. PLL will meet that spec. Well, I was, I was just concerned 
because I'm I I'm looking for like 50 nanosecond GPS time stamping accuracy to universal time. And that has nothing to do with this chip. Well, I was concerned that the that the PLL would 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 introduce error to that. Uh, no, no, no. If you had 50 nanosecond jitter um, on the uh, you're out of luck. internal clock, yeah, you're not getting 120 dB dynamic range. Oh, well, well, yeah. That's you, it requires sub uh, nanosecond timing. Well, then. So, so the bottom line is we got to make this work in either case. Yeah, I'd say wire it up so that you can do either, but I think you're not going to need to supply it a separate master clock. I think it'll be uh, much more versatile that way. Well, um, it, it, you know, Jonathan, it also seems like if we give it a particular bit clock, it, it, does it determine what the master clock is going to be based upon fixed ratios or can you tell yes. it any ratio you want or well, we well actually, so so what what we could do, and this is a, a another thing that we could do, is instead of supplying the master clock, or, or the the the, um, the um, feeding the master clock, we could feed the bit clock from the GPSDO. Well, yes, they all come from that. Uh, well, I mean, like, but like, like we could feed it directly from from the GPS DO, and then. But, but we, if you use the bit clock as the source, then you're really going to use the PLL as the source of the master clock in the codec. Yeah. So, well, 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 well if, if we do both scenarios, we what we could do is we could either feed feed it. Um, into the master clock or in into the bit clock and then use the internal PLL. Um, so it, it we could do it either way. It's just and, I, you're going to add a lot of complexity if you're going to put a multiplexer on the bit clock and decide is it going to come from the clock module or the FPGA? Well, now you got a multiplexer uh, on the clock line, which is not really such a good idea. No. No, so then we would have to pick either or, or or maybe even add add a jumper. If, if, if you if you feed the M clock from the master clock from the clock module, that's going to be as good a clock as you're going to get on the board, other than maybe the PLL inside the chip. It's the best clock we're going to have externally. It'd be better than the FPGA. Or you could feed the FPGA clock. The M, the bit clock from the FPGA into the, um, use that as your source, and then use the PLL inside the codec to generate the master clock. And you could turn, you could, you could turn the master clock off at the clock module. So you could actually run it one of two ways, having the the master clock generated by the clock module and run everything off of that. Or you could have the bit clock generated by the FPGA, which incidentally is going to get its source from the master clock anyway, right? Clock module anyway. It's just going to be slightly degraded because it's going to be going through FPGA fabric, so it's not going to be as well. well, well, well just, I don't want to. Um, I I would rather either. Um, I, I would rather get the clock directly from from the GPS module than use the M clock input. Well, well, wire, well, yeah, wire it all up and we'll see how it works. So what, what you're saying though, is you, what you want is you want to take the master, you want to take the bit clock from the clock module or no, no, the no. master clock from the clock well, module. Well, right, yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that we have two options here. Right. We Actually, could either, three options. Well, yeah, yeah, we could either, well, well no, no, no. We could feed the the um, master clock, or we could feed the bit clock and run the PLL. 
those would be the two options. Correct. But then the the third option is which source do you use for the bit clock, the FPGA or the clock module? That would be the clock module. Well, that's what you say. The problem is that I have to do the frame sync and the bit clock and latch the data on the bit clock. So you're telling me now the bit clock is going to be supplied by you? Yes. Right? Because that wasn't the original plan. It was not, but maybe it's viable. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's all a matter of who's doing the dividing from master clock, the uh, chip or the FPGA. Because well, well, the 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 the, the whole the the, the um, original plan was was. But the pro there's a problem with um, doing it from the chip, and that is you do not have it synchronized to any absolute time. You have to feed it F sync, synchronized to the GPS, to yeah. get it synchronized to a known time. The F sync has to has to come from the FPGA. It can't be generated by the codec right yeah. and so it's going to come from the bit clock or the master clock and if it comes from the master clock then the fpga has to know how you programmed the part and if it comes from the bit clock it probably also has to know how you program the part yes so yes. so 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 this application what we're using this codec for isn't isn't a normal application so that there's some room to experiment here. Um, well, maybe. how do you mean it's not a normal application? It's just an ADC. I'm talking about the time stamping. Well, that you do externally. The chip doesn't do it. No, no, but but um, um, I, um, the FPGA is going to do that. FPGA is doing your time stamping for you. And it's going to be based upon that bit clock and the frame sync, right? Yeah. But I, I, I was, I was just worried about about the internal PLL in the codec. Why? That, it's um, locked to the, what you're giving it. It has to be. Well, so it's not going to jitter around. So if we have we have these three ways of doing this, okay, we can feed the clock module, we can free, feed the bit clock or the master clock from the clock module, or we can feed the bit clock from the FPGA. Now, I'm trying to understand that what's going to be our advantage to feeding, because if we, if we feed the bit clock from anywhere, then we have to use the internal PLL because that's the way the chip's gonna work, right? If you take yeah. the, the bit clocks, the input, then the master clock's generated by the chip, not by us. So it's generated inside. That, um, that may not be absolutely true. That's, that's what I was hearing, that that's the way it was. So if that's the case, then the question is, is our M clock coming in going to be better than the PLL? And the, but the real question is, if we feed the bit clock with the clock module, which is admittedly cleaner than feeding it from the FPGA, is that going to make the PLL be any cleaner? Okay, so you've got two sources of the internal PLL. Either the FPGA comes from the FPGA, the bit clock, or the bit clock coming directly from the clock module. Now, the one coming from the clock module is obviously lower jitter, but is that going to make the master clock lower jitter coming out of the PLL inside the codec? I don't know the answer. In other words, can, can we wreck the output of the PLL by giving it a noisy clock on the bit clock? I don't know the answer to that. I imagine if we made it noisy enough, we could, but it's not going yeah, to. Yeah, I'm trying, trying to find a spec on that. Because and technically, you know, yeah, you could make it really ratty, yeah. but but well, I don't think the bit clock is going. You know, even though it's coming through an FPGA, I don't think it's going to be. Because what's going to happen is the bit clock is going to be used for all the digital clocking inside the part, which is going to be a don't care for how ratty it is. Only when it it determines the master clock frequency, because the master clock is what's going to cause the actual conversion. 
yeah. and that's that's the jitter that you want to be good to be very low jitter right because that's going to cause the conversions it's the conversion clock yeah not the bit clock so right. bit clock can be crappy it doesn't matter as long as the master clock is not so and the master clock has two sources the pll inside the chip or the m clock pin right yeah so the end clock pin is obviously a no-brainer. It comes from the clock module. It's going to be however good it's going to be, as good as we can make it. But when it comes from the internal PLL, we don't know what the performance is of that. And we don't know whether we can compromise the performance of that with the FPGA or not. Okay, here's the line that is important to me. TI recommends using the PLL for high-performance applications. Hmm. Okay. So kind of tells us to use the PLL and not. Um, That's what it's saying. No, it does say there's a applications report that it's referenced. Um, information on how to configure and use the device in low power mode without using the PLL. So this um, sounds like a compromise type of. That is a really special case that they're, they're implying. Um, so let me ask you this. If we, you, if we fed the bit clock in, could, do we get visibility of the, what master clock gets generated by the PLL? I don't think it matters because it says it, it figures this all out. Right, but I'll, and if we saw- What the, it does do is if it gets an, uh, invalid ratio of F sync to bit clock, it will um, send an interrupt. Okay. But what I was getting at is if we could see the master clock that's generated by the PLL, we could measure it. We could determine its performance. Uh, well, that's I a good question. I don't know if it can is obtain available as an output. It's not available. It is not, okay. No. See, because that's one that I was worried about it. Because, um, I mean, we could trust it. We could trust the performance. And in our experiments, you know, we could take some measurements and see. But that's why that I originally wanted to ignore it and, and, and say that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use that mode because of the PLL. So, so the question becomes then is how, what speed is the master clock going to run at if you give it a bit clock of what 64 times? Okay, you because you're because you're, you're gonna you're gonna get well, it depends on the, uh, the audio sample rate you've selected, right? right. And the it bit time, the width it depends on the width because you can use 16, 24, 32 bit conversions, right? You can select that. So if you pick 32 bit conversions and you got four channels, you got 128 bits that you have to clock out in between frame sync pulses. Because it seems to me you can program the frame sync to be either a square wave or a pulse at the beginning that says sync to that. Yep, you can do both. So you say sync to that. So you're going to get a pulse and then 128 clocks of data and then mm -hmm. and it's offset by three or something. So you, you take care of that. And then it's you're going to offset. Get, you're going to get another frame sync and you're going to get another 128 bits of data, which is going to be your four 32 bit samples that you converted now. Okay. So that means it's going to be, um, and, and so if you're, if you're converting at 192 K, then you're going to have 192 K times 128 is going to be your bit clock. Right. Uh, yeah. And I don't know, what can, what can we go up to, 768K? What's the maximum sample rate? 768K sample rate, I believe, is its max. So 768,000 times 128 equals 98 megahertz. That's, that can't be right. Because I thought the maximum was about 40, 49 megahertz. Well. That was at 100, 192. Oh, you're right. 
So that's, it's, it's it's actually it's maximum bit clock is uh, 24, 25 megahertz. They're oh. saying 24.576, but that's the uh, 48 kilohertz. Yeah, that's that's, not, that's mod, that 96, multiple. That's that 96 megahertz divided by four. Yeah. Okay, just. But I yeah, I just was looking at a table of all the different modes supported, and the highest bit clock is 24.576 well, so that megahertz. means you're not going to be able to do four channels of 32 bit and 768k sample and get the data out unless you use more than one bit of data at a time i don't think you yeah there aren't 32 bits to be had i thought it was 32 was the maximum no uh 24 bit audio is what's standard the rest um, of the bits would be padded so in that in that uh, table you've got there, it's only twenty four bits maximum. Because I remember seeing a table that went up to thirty two bits. So, but that data sheet is pretty huge. Yes. Well, I'm looking at the um, switching characteristics right now. I'm trying to see if there's anything that uh, specifies maximum jitter on these clocks, and it doesn't have it. Fascinating. They must have a really good PLL. <laughs> and which I think they do. Yeah, yeah, maybe it is. Because in in the data sheet, that's what that's the mode that they kind of recommended. Um, yeah, they're basically saying do you know you can run I, an external master clock, but do so at your own risk. Yeah. It, it will meet full specs using the internal PLL. Yeah, because I'm not finding any jitter specs, which is really interesting because in the older parts where you were supplying the master clock, we had to be very careful about jitter. And maybe their PLL? Their PLL um, takes that all out. But yeah. I would have thought that there would be at least a maximum jitter spec to meet their um, analog performance, but I'm not seeing it. It's a, probably a question for the apps engineer on it. And it is a new part and, and maybe they just did not include that spec, I don't know. No, it's more likely, more that um, it just wasn't specified. And if you wanna know, you have to ask. Yeah. yeah. That's how yeah. we do things in this business. Yeah. There are a lot of things you, let the user ask. <laughs> it's a way to filter out your your inexperienced users, right? Uh, yeah, back. that that yeah, in part. But no, I, I I was the applications engineer on these parts for analog devices, so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you've dealt with the questions, right? Right. Okay, well then. I would say, you know, we can wire it up to be able to run in either mode, but I suspect that we're gonna just wanna have the FPGA generate these clocks and they will have um, a known relationship to the GPS pulse per second. Yeah, because it'll be digitally divided. Correct. As long as we keep ground balance down to a minimum, should be fine. So, so, so would you think that there would be uh, more benefit to running, if we're going to use the PLL, then um, would there be more benefit to running the bit clock um, from the GPSDO? No. As opposed to from the FPGA? Yeah. No, you're going to want it synchronized to the F-Sync, which the FPGA would be doing. But I could do that. I mean, I could take the bit clock as an input and, sync and generate F-Sync from it. Right. That may be um, at least a mode that we want available. But then you'd have to drive the bit clock from the FPGA instead of from the clock module. 
I mean, you know, here's what we can do is there ought to be a way to do it either way with the strapping option on the VLF board. Because we did this on the RF generator, on the RF module, is the RF module takes a clock from the clock module, and it also takes a clock from the FPGA. Now, you don't want to generally clock the ADC from the FPGA because of the crummy clock that you're going to get. However, if you don't have a clock module and you don't care, I mean, you're going to get lower performance, but you're going to get a much cheaper board, then you can change a couple of resistors on the RF module and you can use the clock from the FPGA. But there's no way, I, I wasn't going to put a buffer or a multiplexer or anything in line. It's actually resistors that you change from this position to this position. And we cleverly laid it out so that there's no stubs, depending on which way you put the resistors. So you can't, but you have to physically go in and unsolder resistors and move them to change the clock, which you would have to do on the clock on the RF module. If we did it this way, no buffer, no multiplexer, just route it from two different places with zero ohm resistors. You could mm -hmm. do that. And then you could get, you could build some one way and you could build some the other way and you could test them and you could see which is better. And you're probably going to find out that like Dave says, the PLL is the best way and never mind the other ways. Right. But then you got to say, well, should we take the PLL? Should we take the bit clock input directly from the clock module or should we take it from the FPGA? As far as I, the data out, it doesn't make a whit of difference. But as far as generating the M clock internally, it might make a difference. Well, well, I still want to take the um, bit, the um, bit clock from. Oh. By the way, I just came up with a thing that uh, supports what I was saying about uh, what edge you clock data on. Bit clock output clock frequency must be lower than eighteen point five megahertz if the SD out data line is latched on the opposite bit clock edge polarity than the edge used by the device to transmit SD out data. Okay. Which is to say they all happen, it, the correct way of doing it is it all happens on the same edge. Okay, and then it takes it on the following edge. No, it doesn't take it on, yeah, on the following edge of the same polarity. Oh, okay. So you get so a it's pipeline cycle of setup time. So, right. So you do so not want to be um, latching it on the falling edge. You want to latch it on the same edge as the data was driven out. Okay. But I can have a clock of latency, right? Because it doesn't, I mean, when we're talking about generating the frame sync, right? Mm -hmm. If I take the bit clock as an input. Yeah, the, I've got to take a look at the timing diagram, but it does specify bit clock period, high and low pulse duration, um, and then F-sync setup time and hold time. To the bit clock. To bit clock, correct. Okay. Figure three. So. Okay. But I still think that we should feed the bit. We should get the bit clock from the clock module, and then also feed it into the FPGA. Yeah, if we. Yeah, that would be the cleanest. But yeah, that's 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 keep that's it, it's, pro it, it, it's looking like it implies that the PLL is being run from bit clock, which would make sense. And then F sync is. Um, being synchronized from bit clock. And it yeah. gives you the, the setup time and the hold time for F sync. It would be better if the FPGA generated bit clock and frame sync and then it came off of the clock module. Well, we need to look at this, but I suspect that the cleanest would be to get the bit clock from uh, the clock module and have F, have, um, have it being fed to the FPGA and to the VLF card. And yeah. then the FPGA generates the F-Sync. Yeah. And, and that then, it's F-Sync that also needs to be 
uh, synchronized to <clears throat> the pulse per second. The, okay. Which just means pulse per second initializes some count or yeah, something. Yeah. So, and the thing is that I've got an extra, I've got clock inputs coming from the clock module directly to the FPGA. And theoretically, we can program the outputs to be phase synchronous. So mm -hmm. you would not need to feed me a clock from the VLF module. I could get one from the clock module that would be the same exact phase yes. and clarity as what I'm what the clock module is feeding the VLF. Right. Module. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So then we wouldn't need we'd just take the clock input, feed it into the bit clock. Yes. And then I would be responsible for getting the same programming the clock module to give me the same clock output that you're getting. Yeah. And then use that to generate frame sync and to take the data. Yeah. And that would simplify the clocking on your board, Jonathan, because you wouldn't have to do all that funky buffering. No, I would only just need the converter. Just take an LVDS. In fact, you could actually program the clock module to give you a single ended output if that's what you wanted. And then would would you you still get a a? Uh, I can that. do the same. I can do the same thing. I can program a single in also, or I can do. I don't know what. If you program one output of the clock module to be LVDS and one to be single in, I don't know what the phase relationship is between the two. Yeah, well, so I mean, it well if. Maybe you know, that's, that's, that's almost better if you buffer the bit clock and send it to me. So you take an well, LVDS and, and no, take an LVDS receiver off of the clock module to single ended, and you take it to two single ended outputs. One goes to your part, what your codec, and one goes to me single ended. Then they're synchronous. So I see the exact same thing that you're. Uh, bit clock sees right, and then I can use that to generate frame sync and to take the data, and I don't have to worry about programming the clock to yep. be the same. And now, what's interesting about clock. their uh, diagram here is they're basically you could create frame sync. The chain frame sync can change on the falling edge of bit clock because okay. it's a it's a the bit clock has to be 18 nanoseconds. 18 megahertz? Right. No, 18 nanoseconds between rising edge to falling edge or falling edge to rising edge. That's 49 megahertz. Right? But that's the no, there there are two specs. Um, first, it can be a minimum of 40 nanosecond period, which is 25 megahertz. But then each at each, you know. High time and low time has to be a minimum of 18 nanoseconds. That's just saying where in in that can oh, the so um, 40 to 60 percent duty cycle then. Correct. And then um, the F sync has an eight nanosecond hold time or setup time. So you could change it on the rising edge a bit clock, but you'd have to make sure it stayed around for eight nanoseconds. The easiest thing is to just make a change on the falling edge of bit clock and it meets all the timing specs as yeah. long as you don't incur um, too much delay in it in generation and sending it back out. Okay. Um, so there, there's a fair amount of leeway in there that we can, with fast buffers, you're not going to have any problem setting it up. We should set up a good, uh, t an actual timing diagram for it, but you it know, looks like it's going to be pretty simple to program the FPGA up. with the setup and hold times that are needed and see right. if you meet timing. Yep. But uh, yeah, feeding, uh, feeding bit clock straight from GPS from the clock card is going to be the cleanest. And bit clock is a single ended input, right? Yep. Yes. You could send it differential, but it, it's used internally, single-ended. But there's only one pin is what I'm getting at. You yes, correct. So. 
So if you did that, you'd feed that into BitClock and you would use that uh, GPIO pin, Jonathan, as the BitClock input? No, no that's master clock. Yeah, that would be unused. There's or, a there's a dedicated bit clock in F sync. So then it becomes an input. B yeah, clock it's an input. input. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, yeah. So that that um, GPIO pin is is either unused, or if you want to use I squared S and instead of TDM, it becomes the second data output. Okay. Now wait a minute. Hold on. I'm looking at the pin. This, uh, operation here. So there are a number of different modes for it, but yeah, it's essentially SDS. for so normal modes, it's extraneous for what they consider. Okay, so then modes. what we would be doing is we'd be taking the data out and SD out. We'd be being fed the B clock. We would generate the D, the frame sync. So the FPGA would take B clock in would generate frame sync back to the codec and it would take the data synchronous with the frame sync well for synchronous with the b clock correct and the gpio one would just be not used right but yeah we could send a, a programmable master clock to it if we wanted to but i really don't think that's necessary bit clock is the uh, key here yeah, so if you were to use it in the master clock mode, you'd feed master clock into GPIO one, right? And then the yep. clock would not be used. It would be an output rather. No, 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 no. You still would use it as an input. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but using it, using you know, they do have the mode of running master clock and having bit clock and F sync generated internally, but you're not going to be able to synchronize that. Okay, that's so a is, that's a standalone yeah. mode that that's this not is, what this inherently is the problem that I was looking at is okay. So suppose we run GPIO one as the master clock input from the clock module, mm -hmm. then we have to generate B clock and F sync off of that. Right. Yeah. What what phase relationship does it have? I I saw I found that nowhere. Yeah, it's not in there. So how do I generate B clock? How do I, because master clock is going to be faster than B clock, right? Because it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an unspecified thing. And my experience is that these chips will internally synchronize um, master clock and uh, you know, the, the incoming bit clock and F syncs. If they're not being generated internally, they're synchronized um, in there, you know, they have synchronizers so to you figure that out. The B clock and the F sync would be synchronized with the master clock coming in on GPIO one. So everything would be synchronized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it would it would internally figure out what edge it was would be uh, clocking yeah. it on. But in terms of, of how we're gonna wire this up. It sounds like the B clock comes from the clock generator and GPIO comes from nothing. So you really you can't run. I suppose you could feed it from, you could feed GPIO and B clock from the same clock. That wouldn't work. Yeah. Because in the case where you're going to run GPIO one as an M clock input, then you yeah. got to run B clock as a different <clears throat> input. Now I'll point out, it, well, I've already pointed out that Running it in master mode is a is a whole nother data sheet. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, there's another application. There, there, yeah, there's the, another they call master, it an application mode, report. Master yeah. mode being when you feed M clock in on GPIO one, right? Right. Yeah. You feed your own master clock in, and then you have the chip generating the uh, bit clock. So they're really F telling you not to do that kind of then, right? That's so, how I'd put it. <laughs> That's how I take it. Well, so it sounds like the best thing is to feed the B clock from the clock generator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll generate an F sync through, um, through uh, the FPGA. That bit, from what I'm re reading here, bit clock is the key. That's what you want to keep clean. Yeah. F sync can jitter around quite a bit. Yeah. It just needs to be within a, 
a window of being able to be synchronized. Well, yeah, well, it has to, and it also has to be the a, the correct number of bit clocks wide. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to count it pr properly, yeah. and it will shut down internally if you get it wrong. Yeah. So then, um, the only question is, are you going to send me a buffered copy of B clock? And I suggest that we do it that way. Yeah, we could have it. I don't think that's a big deal um, as long as we keep the buffer delays down and can meet the, those uh, timing specs. It's probably, um, but there's also nothing that says you can't um, have it fed in parallel from the clock module. Say that again. And, well, yeah, can't the clock true. module send it to yes. both cards? No, it can't. It won't parallel? send the same output, but you can generate two outputs out of that synthesizer chip that are synchronous outputs. Yeah, you, well, you'd have, yeah, they have to be synchronous. They're, they're, it's designed to do that. So you yeah. program all the features the same. And I guess you you know, we, we also want the edge of bit clock to be synchronous with pulse per second. Um, because the F sync is going to come from bit clock. Well, it's good. The output is going to be phase locked to the 10 megahertz. That's right. adjusted by the FP, by the GPS. Right. But it has to have a known phase relationship to uh, pulse per second. How are we going to do that? There, there are ways to synchronize that. We have to do it. Because when I'm and then you talk about just to get the timestamp correct, right? That's what yeah. this is for? Yeah. So, because what I'm figuring is the FPGA is going to keep an accurate timestamp value and it's going to be updated every pulse per second. Yeah. And it's going to be updated at, at that pulse per second coming from the GPS is that's the thing that's within 50 nanoseconds of when the time changes. Yeah. When the timestamp changes. Right. So then whatever the timestamp value is, when the 16 or the, the, the data value from the VLF module comes in, that's what timestamp it gets. Yeah. So you'll be within whatever the accuracy of the one PPS is, that's what you're going to get as your timestamp. Just have to make sure if the if the timestamp changes at the same time, you uh, don't do something wacky. But typically, that's easy enough to do, and you synchronize it with the high speed clock so that you know the the amount of uncertainty is only you know eight nanoseconds or or sixteen nanoseconds. And since we're getting that from the from the clock module. And uh, um, then we should be uh, okay. Well, the problem is that I don't know that the, the timing relationship between the one PPS and the frequency of the clock that you're going to get out that's your bit clock. Yeah, that may be problematic. There may be uncertainty there. But what I mean, the uncertainty is going to be in terms of plus or minus a tick at 18 megahertz. Or 25 megahertz, whatever the, the maximum frequency is. Right. But that's 40. Well, that's 40 nanoseconds. That's within your 50 nanosecond spec, yeah. but still. Yeah. You can do better. And there's got to be a way to. Yeah. Hmm. This is coming out of the uh, uh, Silicon Labs chip. The uh, what? The PPS? Yeah. No, not the uh, PPS, but the bit clock. The bit clock, yeah. Yeah. But so the and the GPS is going to feed into. See if I get this. How if I remember the architecture? I wish Tom was still here. He would know how this this goes. But the um, the synchronization occurs inside the synthesizer chip. So we're going to be feeding in a GPS ten megahertz input yeah but 10 megahertz doesn't tell you phase relationship to pulse per second 
Um, that's true. It? It, it yeah. Won't. And this is going to be an odd ratio to the PPS, to the 10 megahertz. It, it's going to be unrelated, I think. Well, no, it, it's got to be related. It's got to be um, the 10 megahertz is phase locked to the pulse per second. Well, so there better a be fixed relationship there. But right. The, if you're phase but the, uh, the output, but the the audio clock, the twenty four point whatever clock, is only going to be essentially synchronous to the ten megahertz on the one PPS boundary. Well, but it can't be because it's a different frequency on the one PPS boundary. It uh, still has to add up to a second's worth. I guess that's true. Your least yeah. common denominator is one second worth of counts. Right. The least the least common denominator is actually at a mega, at a kilohertz, but because at least if you're doing something based on the forty eight kilohertz, it's a multiple of that. Um, but like for twenty four point five seven six megahertz has a relationship to one kilohertz yeah. but, still, but you know, still i'm still wondering though how important this is because every audio sample this audio sample is going to be sampled at 100 say 192 kilohertz or 384 kilohertz that's a lot of 10 megahertz clocks and you're only going to get every 384k you're going to get one audio sample or you're going to get your four audio samples so how to, okay, so I'm going to see all the bits come in at the end of the bit time when I got all 24 bits for all four channels. There's the mark. That's the point at which I say that's the timestamp. But those samples were sampled in the past. Yeah, but there's a known time relationship. So then they I aren't adjust, gonna... my, adjust my time sample to, to take into account the latency of when the actual... Or it... Or just be measured in in data analysis. You subtract that out. Okay, and how will we know what that is? Because it's going to be a measurement. It'll be dependent upon the rate at which you are clocking the codec. Because it'll be different if you're sampling at forty eight kilohertz. Right. Well, you have to come up with a spec um, for whatever modes that you're operating. Just so long as it's determinable. I yeah, mean, because uh, remember the the uh, digital filter will also have a uh, that's true. That's true. Finite delay that you have to take into account. But you know, under any given mode, if you keep the conditions the same, it should have should be deterministic. A, a deterministic delay. Okay, so then what it comes down to is. We have the shutdown going from the FPGA to the codec. We have the frame sync going from the FPGA to the codec. We have the bit clock and the data going from the codec to the FPGA. And then we have the I2C interface, which is two lines, which are bidirectional. Well, the clock comes from the FPGA and the data goes both ways. Right. And do you see, foresee anything else, Jonathan, for IO? No. Um... That's it. As long as, um, as long as we could, um, so with the bit clock, if I'm going to feed the clock back to you, uh, am, am I going to feed it single ended? Yes. Or yes. Single okay. So then, what I need. Do you think that the output of the converter could drive? both the um, codec and the, no, the no, pin? No, you have to have a, two outputs because you don't want to you don't want to chain the outputs like that if you can avoid it because it won't be a won't be a nice signal. What are you chaining? Well, he wants to take the output of the differential receiver from the clock module and just feed it to both the bit clock input and the uh, connector going to the FPGA. Just like a Y, I don't think. Yeah, we would have to buffer it. And so what you do is you take a buffer, you feed the, uh, and I, I, you could probably find one of these, an LVDSN and two single-ended outs. 
Okay. And the delay between the two single ended outs is picoseconds because they're matched because they're in the same part on the same die. Yeah. yeah. And then you feed one to the codec and one to the FPGA. And then that means I see that bit clock at exactly the same time your codec does. Okay. All right. I mean, plus All right. the connector to let, you know, the, won't be exactly the same, but it'll be very close. Okay, that makes sense. You know, um, here at the at the uh, leaf module connector, and right now I've got one, two, three, four, five. I've got four or five. I've got seven differential lines that are running on VCCIO, which you're not going to use. Okay, I have. Uh, the PPS signal, and let's see, from the clock module to the F. Yeah. So, didn't you say, Jonathan, you needed the PPS signal for something? No. Uh, well, that's going to um, that's going to go into the FPGA, um, and the time stamping is going to be done in the FPGA. Uh, uh, so, so, I, I so have no, GPS, I don't need it. I have the PPS from the GPS going to both you and the FPGA. So if, um, if you need it, it's there. Oh, um, yeah, that that would be like a debugging. Uh, OK, so it's not really necessary then. No, I mean, um, because I think I originally said that I wanted it um, so I could feed it in as an audio input um, to uh, one of the inputs. But, oh, right, um, right, okay. Um, Somehow to measure the latency. Measure latency through your... No, that, it's just um, historical that uh, a common way of synchronizing audio channels um, is to feed the PPS into one channel and then you have it in your, uh, your record. Yeah, because that's how Paul does it in his software. But see, Paul is is de dealing with multiple clocks here, where we're only just dealing with one. Okay. Yeah. So we're able to actually synchronize it directly rather than having to um, try to get a um, time sync into an asynchronous system. Yeah. So right. Now, right. So we just do all that time stamp and synchronization in the FPGA, and you won't do anything on your board. Right. Now, no, one right. thing you're you're talking about ten megahertz to the bit clock. This is the bit clock wouldn't come off the ten megahertz. It would come off the hundred twenty two megahertz. It would come off the synthesizer chip that has ten outputs that are programmable from the clock. Why wouldn't clock. it come from the one twenty two? That's why it's one twenty two point eight eight. Well, you that's can... an audio frequency. Okay, but you can't. Feed 12288 to the codec, right? You... No, you have to divide that down. I thought that the clock module would be doing that. The clock module is it just just has the synthesizer on it, which it does divide down. Yeah, but not from the 1222 megahertz, well, which is the high it, performance clock. It, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, what you want is uh, 49 megahertz synchronous with 12288, and I don't see how you're going to get that because there's, it's not a multiple. So, no, it, it is. I, I don't know where you're getting 49, but oh, because because that's uh, you're clocking the input at 48k, 128k, you know, whatever. Right. No, but um, the 122.88 megahertz is actually a multiple of 12.288, right. which is a fundamental clock rate for 48 kilohertz sampling. Let's see, see what you could do then is the, 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 the Silicon Lab synthesizer chip has like, I think, six separate synthesizers on it. Digital controlled synthesizers. Which right. Fractional, fractional end synthesizers. So you could actually run the VCOs 
for each of the synthesizers at 122.88 or, or a multiple of that, and then divide them down synchronously, and you'd end up with synchronous outputs. Yeah. I believe that would work. I mean, that's kind of what it's designed to do, I think. Right. I mean, yeah, we're going to have to think about this, uh, this clock system. I wish we could get uh, John Ackerman on here to, to, uh, to, to attend the meeting here and talk yeah. to us about this because he would know whether this is a possibility. And Yeah, why doesn't he get on this? Uh, he's pretty busy and it's, late, <laughs> and it's late for him. He's not a late guy, I think. So, yeah. Just like I'm not an early riser. So. But he's at the far end of the time zone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it shouldn't be that hard, right? <laughs> so anyway, let me take a look at this and what... Uh... Yeah, the, more is going to need to be uh, discussed about the clock system. But I think we understand how the ADC is going to get fed. And, and here's the other thing we could do, like for the shutdown input to the codec. We could make that like an open collector input. Okay. Yeah. And and because it's it's going to the codec, I can use I can take a pin off of my one and a half volt bank and I can make it is because it, I believe it's active low. Is that not do you know uh hold on, I've got the pin out right here. If it doesn't have the shutdown pin on it, nice. Oh, there it is up here. Shutdown is uh active low. Active low, yeah. Yeah. So what we could do is we could feed that from a one and a half volt output of the FPGA and just make it open drain and put a pull up to whatever voltage you're using. Okay. And because it doesn't have to be fast. It's it's not uh, it's not right. a single path. So and so then I need uh, an output and two inputs plus an I two C. Yeah. And again, the I two C is open collector anyway. So we can make that work when I got a couple of spare pins for that, that are on VCC IO 34, which is the three voltages that really leaves only three pins that have to be um, fixed. Of which two of them are your output so you could make those 3.3 and I could hook them pretty much anywhere. Okay. And then the frame sync is the only one that has to be 3.3. And I think I can scrounge up a single. In fact, I think I have a 3.3 volt output. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I have to, I have to, okay, so I need to fix that. So, oh. So then I'll make um, IOVDD on the codec 3.3 volts. And, and we'll run it there. Okay, so you're going, because you have a VCC IO from the leaf to the clock module. Yeah. You specify that IO, and that's what clock voltage you're going to get back. So you could do that anything you want. I don't care. And it, it doesn't have to be the same as anything else. It's just that if you say, if you set it to 3.3, you're going to get a 3.3 volt. So you need to look at the synthesizer chip and see what happens when you give it, because each of the 10 outputs has its own VCC IO. And that's what that's connected to. So you need to go back to the Silicon Labs chip and see what you're going to get for your 3.3 volts that you give it. Well, well, we don't really have to worry about that because we're 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 going to use the uh, converter. Oh, right, right. But if you want to make it LVDS, you got to give it the right voltage to get LVDS. And I don't know what that voltage is. And this is what screwed us over on the uh, FPGA was that. In order, in order to get 1.8 volt LVDS, you have to yeah. set the bank to 2.5 volts, which is counterintuitive, okay? Right, yeah. So, but that makes the, the VCCIO 2.5, which is not correct for driving any of the other signals that aren't LVDS. So right. it gives you a problem. So if you use it, so whatever clock chip you pick, you have to make sure that that Silicon Labs chip will drive it directly because that's what's connected to the pins. There's no buffer. The buffer is there. I mean, I should say there's no, there's no separate buffer. The clock part has buffers built into it. Yeah. So 
And you know the part number of that part, right? Do I need to give it to you? The one on the um, top module? Yeah, which one is he using? He is using, one second, I will. Uh, it's a 53 something, right? I There's so many of them that have gone by so many times, I don't really need <laughs> I'll tell you that. The, What's in the schematic now I know is the right one because that's the one that we put in. So, okay, it's, 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 it's a 5345A. Okay. SI 5345A. Okay. Dash, dash D. And there is a difference between the, the, the A is on all parts and then there's an A through D part. So you got to pick the right one. Okay. SI 5345A-D. And what uh, clock frequency is it being fed, or does it have multiple <laughs> choices? I didn't ask that. Supposedly 48 to 52 megahertz, but I don't have an answer yet because I haven't gotten hold of the Raycon guy mm. to tell me what clock frequencies I can get. Why, I just, is, why isn't it derived from the 122? I, That's our good clock. And everything wants to be synchronous to it. Well, we don't have a clock generator for 122. Where is that coming from? It's coming from the synthesizer. So we take 50 megahertz input and then a 10 megahertz reference from the GPS and we synthesize 122.88. From, from the 10 megahertz. So there's GPS not an actual 122. That's correct. Point eight eight oscillator. That's correct. Aye. Aye. That's not so, how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, well, so I John, guess we could make one if we wanted to use the put a low performance uh, clock module on there and skip the GPS and put a one twenty two eight eight oscillator on it. But this is what John came up with to generate our frequency. So I'm, I really wish he'd be in more contact about. The design of the clock card because he's been making some strange yeah, design yeah. choices that don't fit with how we usually well, use at least these. one of the things we do have is we have the option for an external input clock input so if you want to feed something different than that into but the, then you have to develop your own then you do gpsdo this is supposed to have been the gpsdo yeah. well let's corral him and get him to come on here and explain it for mm -hmm. us Okay. So I'm sure I'm sure so he, more shall be revealed. I've got to go to bed. Yeah. I got to go to bed too. I was up. I got no sleep last night, so I'm <laughs> I'm zoned out here. Yeah. Well, we've resolved some things and generated more questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, still we we made made some pretty good progress here. Yes, yeah, so but I understand what you're trying to do, Jonathan. We we need to try to get the clock system to to do it properly. Yeah. I agree that you want to have the uh, system time synchronous. If we can do it to 50 nanoseconds, that would be great. Even at VLF, it is important. Yeah. So I have a clock input coming from the clock module, and I have a single-ended clock output going from directly from the VLF to the FPGA which is where you're going to drive your, your bit clock out to me. And then I just have to make sure we get the, um, the, uh, the data output and the coda and the FS, the frame sync input. Over right. to you. Yeah. And the frame sync has to have a synchronization to pulse per second. To, okay. So that we know um, within a certain you know, window when the samples are starting. Well, so, so if we were to just hold frame sync off until the first pulse per second comes in and then synchronize it to that, then mm -hmm. that's sufficient. Then it, yeah, uh, basically. the PLL will, will basically line itself up with it. Right. As long as it uh, stays that way for the rest of time. <laughs> but you can set it up so that every now and then it gets or even every second it synchronizes it resynchronizes yeah we can do that resyncs yeah especially on f-sync because you don't you know as i said point out it can jitter 
a few nanoseconds either way and it's not going to be a problem it's big it's clock a, we need to keep clean well as long as you relatively want, clean as long as you have the right number of bit clocks between frame sinks you can't oh well, yeah and that better not change yeah no that's yeah. got to be at a set counter yeah but uh you know the the frame sync will be derived from the bit clocks but it wants to be um when there's a, a pulse per second comes in, that's what wants to start an F sync. Right. Yeah. And then as long as every all the clocks are synchronous, they will stay put. It's just that you can't be moving frame sync around because to realign it with pulse per second. No, you don't have to move it around. It won't be moving around. Better not be jittering. Um, you don't want bit clock to be jittering relative to pulse per second but either. This is going to be an integral number of bit clocks per, no, per so pulse per second, right? Now, is this pulse per second direct out of the GPS receiver or is it a... Yes, yes. Then what happens when you lose... Um, You're screwed. There's no... There's, there's no... Uh, um, what do they call it? Holdover? Holdover. There's, what do you mean there's no holdover? There's, there's That's holdover the whole point the of the system. There's a holdover for the clock based upon the, the high performance oscillator that we have, but there's no GPS. There's no PPS because it comes from the GPS. Now, and I take that back, there's no holdover. The PPS, when you lose a um, satellite lock, mm -hmm. I don't know what the PPS does. I don't know what the, does it drift? Is it? The, yeah, well, we need to know what it does. Yeah, well, well that's, a, that's a John question because I don't. I've yeah, and you can't be it. having it just jump around. On on the Trimble, um, if if you lose um, GPS lock, the GPS's internal oscillator um, uh, keeps that going. Um, but what happens, yeah, but then what happens when it gets back into it. lock? Do you jump or do you slowly? Move? Yeah, there are two ways of doing it. One is you shift frequency to bring it back in slowly, or the other is you jam sync, which is boom, boom, I, over, over. right. I believe it's brought in slowly on the trimble. Yeah, well, um, but but you see what this on the U blocks. I mean, that's the question. U blocks yeah. is what we're using. Yeah. So. Well, well, well. Normally on 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 the GPS modules, at least with the Trimble, the um, if you lose satellite lock, then the internal oscillator keeps it keeps it going, and and that has some drift. So you and still then, get one PPS too, right? Yeah, it it'll still you still yeah. Usually they'll continue on a PPS, but you can a lot of them you can set them to either jam sync it or drift it in right well, yeah one of the, but we need to know what it is but john and this is talking, not a trimble this is a john john <laughs> is talking, talking about what happens when you lose lock and what happens is you get nmea sentences that tell you you lost lock so therefore you get enough time to say hey the one pps isn't valid anymore because we lost lock and so you'll get a one but pps there, but it might not be exactly on the second so yeah well anyway because we were talking about what do you do in that case do you do you stop the one pps because it's not valid anymore it's it's too far off or what and that was one of the things that we debated is we can monitor the nmea sentences and we could jam the one megahertz the one pps low if it was yeah. not accurate so you, you then you'd be obvious you lost lock yeah you get anyway more we need to talk about this later because yeah. we don't have all the info. Okay. All right. Okay. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Seven three. All right. Seven three. three. Good night. Are you there, Dan? I see Mike is hugging with us. He's gone. Joe's still here too. You're muted, Dan. Your microphone's off. Yeah, 73, everybody. 73, Joe.
So I've got we've got the meeting with Henry tomorrow. Hold on yeah. a second here. So I I we, talked with Steve. I talked with Steve this afternoon. Okay. So uh, we're going to get together around nine nine fifteen tomorrow morning for about ten or fifteen minutes, and then the meeting is at uh, ten o'clock. Okay. Are you sending out the invite, or am I, or what? You are, I guess. You are. I, I am. If okay. you teach me how to do it, Scotty, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> I'm just not too sure. Do I'll you have a it. Zoom account? Do I have what? Do you have a Zoom account? No. Okay. Well, you can no, sign up for. A, do is get one. You can sign up for a free account, and you get. It's the same one I got. So. Okay. Or I can send it out whichever. Well, I why don't you send it out this time, and then I will. Sit okay. down and figure it out and be able to do it next time. So all you do is you sign up for a Zoom account. It's free. And other than them bugging you constantly to upgrade because you get more features. Yeah. And then when you go to zoom.com and you click on um, my account and you log in, or if you've, you've been kept yourself logged in, then it's there. And then it gives okay. you the whole page of how to set it up. And what happens is you end up with a, once you put the time, and in fact, let me just do it right now while I'm doing it. So, um, so then anyway, so you come up with your account, and then you go up to the top, and it says schedule a meeting. And you click sure. on the schedule a meeting. It brings up another page. You put in the time and the date and all the – in fact, it, it came up as tomorrow – oh, it's 5.10. No, it came up today at 9 p.m., so – We'll go a little calendar. We'll pick the 11th, and we'll pick 10 a.m. This is this will be the main meeting. All right. Come on, a.m. What a pain in the neck. Okay, 10 a.m. And I just put it in for one hour because it, it'll kick us off after 40 minutes anyway. But Okay, and then you put your time zone in, but it automatically fixes the time zone. Okay. Uh, and then let's see, uh, passcode. And I normally uncheck the waiting room thing because I don't. Otherwise, a pain in the ass. You have to every time they come in the waiting room, you got to admit them. Oh, okay. Which is stupid. And then I put allow participants to join at any time. And uh, that's basically it. So then what okay. happens is when you say when you say save, then it generates a link. And if you go over to the right, it says copy invitation. And you click on that, and it puts a copy of the thing on the clipboard. Uh -huh. And then you can go generate an email to whoever you want and, and then paste, it in. paste okay. it in, and then you're done. Okay, so I copied the meeting invitation. And now I'm going to go over here and say write. And then it's going to be to, to you at N4XWE. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Stevie K. Oops, come on. Calandros at zpci.com. And Charlie's joining us too, right? Um, I haven't talked to him. I imagine he'll, he will, but it's up to him. And even for you, I mean, I mean, Steve and I can do this ourselves. It would be better if you were there because I have a feeling there will be some questions. Okay, well, I can make uh, it. But, but it's not essential. I haven't gotten him his uh, IQ2s yet, so I want to talk to him about that at nine when we get together. Okay. So it's you and Stevie K and Charlie and uh, probably Henry would be a good one to. Yeah, Henry would be a good invite as well. Okay, so I got Henry, Charlie, Stevie K, and you. And let me send one to myself. Just so everybody's on the list. And okay, um, meeting at 10 a.m. MST. E -E PM oh, e -E -T. E -D -T, right. Okay. And are we calling this a particular, just a status meeting, I guess? Uh, it's just a progress report, I think. So, well, whatever we called it last time is good enough. Oh, I don't know what it was last yeah, time. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I just call it status meeting. Is that okay? 
Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And should I call it safe comm status meeting or just status? Yeah, I'll call it safe comm status meeting. And it's safe dash C O M, right? S A E F E dash C O M. Uh, safe comm wireless. Hmm. Right, okay. safe comm wireless. Okay. And then come down here, paste it in. Change my name so that I'm out of ha so that my ham call letters aren't there. <laughs> <laughs> I think Henry's a ham as well. Oh, he is really? Yeah, he, he's a tech. He's been a tech for like 20 years or whatever, he told me. We can ask him about that tomorrow. Yeah, in fact, I think I looked at, he has a very unique last name. I looked him up. Okay, so last name is... Wotunik. Who? Wotunik? Wotunik. W-O-J-T-U-N-I-K. Oh, okay. What is that, uh, Middle Eastern? I have no idea what it is. <laughs> he strikes me as like Lebanese or... Uh, that very well could be. Uh, you know, something in that in the Middle East somewhere. Yes. Okay, so I got this all set to go. One, two, three, four, five participants. Did I leave anyone out? You, me, uh, BBK, Henry, and Charlie. But I think that's everybody. Okay, send. Okay, now let me do another one. At nine, you want it to be at nine? No, uh, well, we do it at nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. Well, I tell you what, it doesn't give me the option to do 9.15. It's only every half hour. So I'll start it at 9. We can show up at 9.15. Okay, before. that's fine. I can change the invitation when I... No, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. No waiting room. Allow any time. LSMFT. Okay. No, oh, I should have... Never mind. I should have changed the title. You can change the title and the topic and all that, which I did not do. So copy it, copy it. Now here we go with a new email, right? And it's going to be this time to you. Me. Stevie K. And Charlie. Safe. Um, pre meeting. Pre meeting meeting. Paste it in. And then you make changes to it, like uh, change my name. And I'm changing the meeting to 9.15. Just so it's an odd time. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Topic, my meeting. I love it. Pre <laughs> meeting meeting. Okay. So Henry went to school at, at NJIT. No kidding. No kidding. So he has a BSEE from NJIT and an MBA from Rutgers. Wow. I just like the fact that they had a guy from RPI on there. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was cool. I can't believe he's at RPI. There's no W2SZ. That's just, that's not right. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, W8LT has been QRT for like the last 10 years, I think. Yeah, but. Yeah, I guess LT and this said were, were, were both big gun stations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, Cockroach, K3CR, Penn State. They were big gun stations. Cockroach? Before. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call them? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> well, I like the uh, WAGP. 
The Grid Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> they were a VHF club, and they were the Grid Pirates, and they had oh, two right. school buses that they outfitted with all their gear. If you Google them, you could see their school buses, and they may have three of them by now. They are all set up with VHF uh, stations, and oh wow, pretty serious ops. They're from uh, West Virginia, I think I want to say, or or yeah. Eastern Ohio. Let's see what grid pirates. KAGP, sorry. Oh, KAGP. And they are, where are they? Oh, man. W3ZZ? That guy's been dead for like 10 years. <laughs> this has not been updated in a long time. The last contest was, uh, oh, wait, here we go. KAGP Rover ARL June VHF 2014. And then the next report is from 2020. So let's see what they've got here. Oh, give me a break. Verify that it's me so I can look at pictures. So Henry is KC2ZMI to Mike in India. ZMI, huh? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here's the grid pirates. Man, what happened? They don't have any school buses anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> they downsized to a minivan. Oh, well, a maxi van. Oh, man, this is lame. I mean, it's cool, but it's compared to what they had. Let's see. They, I can't even tell. It looks like a Honda, maybe. Oh, be darn. A Honda, a full-size Honda van. Well outfitted, but man, what happened to the school buses? I'm trying to figure out whether they're from West Virginia or what. <laughs> West Virginia, what's the call sign again? K-A-G-P. Uh, it's for West Virginia. Michigan, Ohio, and West Virginia are the eight, zone, eight call. Right, but I don't. Maybe they're Ohio, for all I know. Well, it could be. And I don't think they're in Michigan. In fact, let's see if there's a plate visible on their vehicle here. <laughs> Are you kidding? They have too much shit in the way for you to see a plate. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all pictures. They have no text, which oh. is kind of weird. Well, you can look them up in QRZ. Yeah. So. Yeah, W3ZZ passed away in 2011. Uh oh. He was a big time rover. No, 2012, he passed away. Huh. Okay, let's see. Let's look back to 2012 and see if they had the buses. Which reminds me, I, you know, I looked up uh, Eric Ellison's. Call sign in the OLS database. Oh yeah, WA WA for his license MSW? expired in 2016. It was never renewed. I bet he passed away. It could be, but I looked for an obituary. I didn't see one. Did you? I wonder if this has got searchable silent keys. It's WA four MSW. AA four SW. AA four SW. Well, here they still had the red bus, the maroon bus, in 2012. <laughs> I wonder if the guy that had the bus, you know, got tired of it and sold it. Could be. It's kind of like having a boat, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you get to do all the work on it, but then 
when it comes time to uh, oh my god here's a picture of the bus what in the hell well they took the wheel of the bus off to show you the power distribution i don't understand this at all why and they got this they got the bus sitting on what looks like a cement block but it crushed it and so they have no Why would you take a wheel off to get a power distribution? That makes no sense whatsoever. Not on a bus. You got to be kidding me. I mean, those wheel, those two men and a boy can't lift one of those tires. And it's dualies in the back, so you got to take two of them off. Well, Tunic is Polish, by the way. Who? Polish. Poland. I still don't understand what. Polska. Wotunik. Wotunik what? Is the name origin is Polish. Oh, oh, of Henry. Okay. Did a context switch on me and I didn't understand. Oh, yeah. Well, both in the <laughs> blue. I've had a lot of those lately. <laughs> I am like gasping for sleep here. I was up at uh, about 5.30 this morning and I haven't, I didn't take a nap today, which is bad. Yeah, I was up at, at uh, 7.30, and I worked out in the yard from 8 till noon. Oh, man. And I'm not used to that. I'm just oh, geez, I'm wiped out. And I, got, and I got to bed the night before at about uh, 2 o'clock. Oh, geez. So I only got about five hours sleep. Oh. I felt like uh, Nathaniel mostly looks. You know, and it's... <laughs> Yeah, they have a map here that shows where people with that last name live. Uh huh. And uh, there are nine. No, oh, this is a very popular name. There are 976 in Poland. There's one in Germany. How many in New Jersey? Uh, it doesn't actually show it by state. It just shows it by country. In the U.S., there are 58 people with that last name. Where did you you see so you found a last name? Yeah, it's called Four Bears. I'll look up my name and see how many cowlings there are. Okay. Uh, let's see here. C O W L I. Oops. C O W L I N G. Cowling surname. Four name. Here we go. Well, it says here it's the 4,967,096th most common name in the world. <laughs> and how many in the U.S.? In the U.S., I there are. <laughs> but they're all in England. Oh, it does have a by state. Oh, here we go. So in Texas, there's one. Uh, this must not be too accurate because in Arizona, there are zero. <laughs> uh. I'm a stealth in Missouri either. So this none this in Missouri. Really I know there's at least two in Missouri. More than that, if you count the unmarried women. Yeah, really. How about in Illinois? Well, thank you. Now you can eat your own dinner your own way. Uh oh. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I can find Illinois. Oh, go away. She's. Wait a minute here. Cal. Oh, that's Coolidge. That's not right. This is in uh, Virginia, K A G P. Huh. Delmarva, Delmarva VHF and Microwave Society. Oh, okay. That's uh, the Del on the Delmarva Peninsula. Emmonsville, where... Virginia. That's where Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia all come together there before it crosses over the water. Delaware, Maryland, and Re oh, okay, so up, up on the northern end of the bay. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of the northern edge. It's about, uh, yeah, it's kind of s south and east of uh, D.C. Okay. Do you ever take that road? 
that goes across the water. Which road is that? From the Delmarva Peninsula to the mainland. I, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you need to drive on that. That was like gone over to the east. That was like an engineering marvel of the world. I've gone over to the eastern shore before, but I don't remember which road it was. No, well, maybe you did go on it and didn't realize it, but it goes over the water for probably twenty miles. So it's like Interstate Ten in Louisiana. Exactly, except this is like real water. This isn't swampland. Yeah, well, yeah, it's okay. Okay, what was I looking here? I don't care about the grid pirates anymore. <laughs> Their buses are gone. That's what I care about. It. Uh oh, <laughs> that's bad. They have a tower on a trailer. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. So much for the grid pirates. <laughs> so it's more John Petrich. Remember W7FU? Yeah. He is uh, into microwave with rovers and stuff. Wow, so Eric's license expired. I bet he's passed away. He was, I know he was having some health issues. He had a heart valve replaced. Did he? I mean, it doesn't show him as having passed away, but, uh, you know, if your license, ex if you're an extra class and your license expires and you don't renew it, it's probably because you're not around anymore. Yeah. It expired in 2016 and it was canceled in 2018. And he's in Conyers? Conyers, yeah. Still shows him. But those things are notoriously inaccurate. I just look for obituaries. Nope. Yeah, his middle initial is C, like Charlie. That might help a little. Harlan Ellison disappeared in the New Year on New Year's Day in the mountains of northern Georgia. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a death sentence. Yeah, don't see him here, so. Nope. I could look forever here. It's yeah, it's like not an uncommon name. And you never know where he might have moved to, or yeah, true. He might not be from Georgia anymore, or he might have right. just. 
got gotten sick, went into assisted living, and didn't renew his damn license. Never. Yeah, that's true too. You never know. He's a murder suspect, but not with his name. No. No. The Black Cemetery list. Oh, my goodness. Holy smoke. I'm thinking, what's such a thing? And if you just look up his call sign, you get a few references to the Delta 44. Yeah. And a quick start guide that he wrote. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. And then nothing. Here you go. Eight CIA's ham radio look up, call sign look up. And there he is, number one, AA4SW. Huh. Quick start guide to TeamSpeak 2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a little outdated. High performance it's HPSDR. Here, listen to this. Hands on SDR, date in 2008. Eric Ellison, Dan Babcock, and Scott Cowling. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you did a presentation that year, and remember, we, that was the year we gave out the CDs, those little uh, credit card CDs. Oh, that was that year? Okay. Yeah, I think that was it. It's got a bunch of Japanese characters here. Uh-oh. Oh, it's my presentation. Ah. Now that I can spell SDR, what now? <laughs> and then thank you to you and Dan, and you and Eric. Oh, no. <laughs> And then you got to sign up to see the rest of the slides. Oh. This is a, and this even got my goddamn copyright notice on it. And it's up on some Japanese page. <laughs> Bastards. It's not allowed. Here's one in Italian. Mentioning Eric Ellison, AA4SW. Huh. Hey, man, we're plastered all over the internet. Oh, yeah. I even saw a picture of me. It was uh, at one of the breakfast meetings for the Payson Radio Club. Oh, yeah? Online? Yeah, online. Here's a picture of Tony Park. But I really oh, think it's gosh. Tony Parks. Father of the soft rock radios. And here's a picture of Eric and Phil Harmon. Oh, yeah. At Dayton 2007 at the Amset. That's Day. right. I remember that year. I was, I was there. Yeah, I was looking up something on Eric Ellison, and I saw there was a picture of Dave Todd. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Dave was a good guy. He shouldn't have had that. Shouldn't have happened to him. Yeah, he was uh, actually he was an ER doctor at a hospital that was twelve miles away from where I grew up. Really, I thought he was Canadian. He was Canadian, but he practiced in the U.S. Oh. Yeah, he his, he was part of a group, and the group was the staff at uh, St. Rita's Hospital. It's called. It's kind of a local Catholic hospital in Lima, Ohio. St. Rita, isn't that the uh, 
patron saint of lost causes? No, no, Saint Rita isn't. I think Saint Rita was like caring for ill people or something like that. It's the hospitals used to all be owned by the Sisters of Mercy. And one of my aunts was actually a Sister of Mercy. She, uh, in fact, she was a nun and she left, she got pissed off and she left and she joined the Air Force. <laughs> she retired as a colonel like 26 years later. Oh my God. And she's still living. She lives in Cheyenne, Wyoming. She's not in very good shape. She's in uh, like an assisted care facility. She has dementia and a bunch of other issues. It's the uh, only surviving sibling of my father. He had three sisters and she's the only one that's still alive. Okay, I'm looking up St. Rita here. Yeah, she was the uh, commandant of nurses at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That was the last place she was. And the first place she went to, believe it or not, was Cheyenne, Wyoming. She never married. She was strange. I mean, like, just a very strange person. Okay, there's four patron saints of impossible causes. St. Rita of Caskia is one of them. Oh, okay. Maybe this is a different St. Rita I was thinking and, about. And, it must and, be more than one. The one you probably think of, St. Jude, is the common one. Yeah, St. Jude is the one I was thinking of. St. Gregory and St. Philomena. Okay. Huh. I mean, I could see how St. Rita's, St. Rita would be, uh... Oh, so it describes her, let's see, she lived a very difficult life on earth. Her parents arranged her marriage at a young age to a cruel and unfaithful man. Because of her prayers, he finally experienced a conversion after almost 20 years of unhappy marriage, only to be murdered by an enemy soon after his conversion. Oh, no. Her two sons became ill and died following their father's death, leaving Rita without a family. She hoped again to enter the religious life, but was denied entrance to the Augustinian convent many times before finally being accepted. Upon entry, she was asked to attend to a dead piece of vine as an act of obedience. She wanted the stick obediently and inexplicably. She came back to you know, life. She came back to life. Yeah, I think that happened a few times in Catholicism. The plant still grows at the They're common. big on resurrection, Catholics are. And it's, <laughs> yeah, they are. For the rest of her life until her death in 1457, she experienced illness and an ugly open wound on her forehead that repulsed those around her. Like the other calamities in her life, she accepted the situation with grace Viewing her wound as a physical participation in Jesus' suffering from his crown of thorns. <laughs> Although her life was filled with seemingly impossible circumstances and causes for despair, St. Rita never lost her, lost her faith, weakened in her resolve to love God. Her feast day is May 22nd. That's my brother's birthday. Oh, wow. That's actually the day I graduated from high school. Countless miracles have been attributed to her intercession. So there you go. That's why you graduated. Because <laughs> it was. Yeah, I graduated from high school on May 22nd, 1966. There you go. Patron saint of the impossible, and you graduated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that at the time. I wish I had. <laughs> Okay. okay. Good uh, I gotta hit hit the hay here. So I see where um uh, is finally taking some heat for being the guy who funded the Wuhan lab. He funded it? Yes. Yeah, I mean his agency did. <laughs> Good God. So the What else are we gonna now, come with? Is or, is it, uh, isn't it a Russian conspiracy? I mean Yeah, it probably is. I heard that um, uh, Biden hired an FBI guy who was the Mr. Russian Conspiracy himself. I didn't even look at his name. Anyway, I'm out of here.
Okay. See, see you in the see you in the morning. Good morning. Bye. Uh, well, for me, afternoon, but for you, morning. <laughs> Did you get the email, by the way? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, I haven't actually looked. Let me look here real quick. And I can tell you exactly. Oh, let's see here. Oh, I better do it on my phone because I don't think I have a bookmark for that. Three, two, three, six. Okay. Yeah, I, I got both the notices. I can tell you in about a minute here, as soon as my phone fires up. Come on, phone. Scott Cowling, Safecom pre-meeting meeting and Safecom status meeting. Got it. Both of them. So here you go. Here's a guy looking down. He says, I love the taste of eggs from free-range chickens. By the way, what are they eating? And the farmer standing behind him says, dog poop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 That's probably true too. <laughs> Chickens will they'll literally eat anything. They they I mean for them they'll eat anything and then they'll let their stomach decide on whether or not it's has any nutritional value. Yeah. <laughs> All right, talk to you later. Okay, see ya. All right.